Okay, the numbers seem to have paused momentarily. Um, so we'll we'll move forward then, Chris. A special welcome to the other RESC centers. Oh, they're climbing again. But uh, let's 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 move ahead. Okay, so uh, we are on a Zoom webinar. Just a couple of uh, security things here. Uh, first of all, there is a chat box. You're welcome to chat during the uh, pres during the presentations. Uh, but uh, the panelists, myself, and the other people that are running the meeting are not going to be really looking at the chat box. If you do have a question, there is a question and answer button. Please use that. Uh, you should not be able to raise your hand. I think we have turned that off. A couple of security things. Do not click on any web links that might appear in the chat or the question and answer windows. Uh, while it's very hard for somebody to Zoom bomb this session, it is possible for somebody to register, come in and put a nefarious link into either the question and answer or chat box. As presenters, we will never put any web links in either of those locations. Okay. Next screen, please. So tonight's program, uh, we're doing the introduction right now. We're going to move quickly into the annual general meeting. I figured the annual general meeting will run 20 to 30 minutes, no longer than that. Depends how long Mike's going to talk. Just kidding. I'll hear it. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> In any case, we should be done uh, by, uh, by 8 o'clock at, at the very latest. And then I'm pleased to have uh, Simon Hanmer as our uh, first speaker tonight. I'm talking about Earth as a planet. And then we have our resident lunatic, uh, Brian McCullough, talking about the decommissioning of the uh, Bright Star Observatory. And in between, we're going to have a five minute bio break, our Messier on Moon Challenge. We've got a number of really interesting observations for tonight and uh, some announcements. So let's move forward then. Turn it over to you, Mike, and let me just spotlight you. Uh, Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, 2020 Annual General Meeting. We, we hold this meeting um, because we are a registered charity and because we are a center of the, uh, the uh, RASC. Uh, so there are some procedural things that we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna try and go through them very quickly here. Um, and uh, and uh, I encourage you as we go through this to, act, to, to uh, ask questions, particularly in, in the, um, when we start talking about the treasurer's, treasurer's report. So next uh, slide, please. Oh yes, uh, good point. So we need to determine if we have a quorum. So Chris is gonna uh, pop up on uh, in order for us to hold this meeting. So Chris is gonna pop up on the, um, Chris, why don't you say, uh, explain it. Right, so you see now on your screen a, um, a question which asks you if you're a member or if you're not. We need to determine if we have enough members to, uh, for, for voting purposes. Um, if you're not a member, ki I, we kindly ask that you vote, you say no, um, but if you are, yeah, that, that's important for us, all right? And then just to add to that, Mike, uh, everyone is welcome to answer this poll, whether they're a member or not, but from here on in, during the AGM, when we do have votes, it will only be four members. Mike, there's some writing in red at the bottom of the window that says, that the host and the panelists cannot vote? Right. Um, that is, that's correct. That's an unfortunate feature of a webinar. But Mike, we already have 48 attendees uh, in, joining us, plus 13 panelists. We are more than double uh, the quorum requirement, so we can now proceed. All right, excellent. And I'm going to X out the uh, grade. Thanks. So next slide, please. Okay, so here's the uh, agenda for the meeting here. Um, I'll let you take a look at it for a moment. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, when Chris sent out the announcement uh, of this meeting, he included the, um, oh, I I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Uh, so we need to adopt, we need to have a motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, prior to this meeting, uh, Dave uh, moved to uh, approve it. And I see it's been seconded by, um, Dave, Dave Parfit. And uh, I don't think we need a vote, Chris, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay, so. 
All Whoa, right. we're, we're skipping ahead quite a bit, Chris. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we'll we're, on the, we're on the wrong slide here. There we go. Okay. Okay, um, I think we went through this. So let's uh, go to the next slide. I don't think we need a vote for this. Uh, Okay, so um, the next thing is we need to approve the, uh, the minutes. Uh, and as I, as I was about to mention, the minutes from the, uh, the 2019 meeting a year ago, uh, Chris sent them out as part of the announcement of this meeting here. So uh, next slide, please. Can we have um, a motion to approve the minutes was uh, by Chris and uh, seconded by Dave. So, so, Mike, well, technically we need a vote on this. If anybody objects, please just write the word object in the question and answer box. Um, so if anybody has any objections to the minutes or maybe you've, maybe there's a correction to the minutes, uh, just please just type it in the question and answer box. Uh, at a regular meeting, we have a show of hands. It's very difficult to do when we're in the webinar uh, format here. So I don't see anything in the question and answer box. So we, we can assume that everybody's approved those. All right, very good, onward. Okay, so president's report. So everyone, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to report that the Ottawa Center had a um, remained uh, strong and healthy uh, in spite of the uh, challenges presented by the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So let me share with you a couple of the highlights. The full report that, I, that, that I'm speaking to is included, will be included in the uh, astronauts, um, in the next issue of astronauts. So without any doubt, in my mind, the single most remarkable achievement of our, our, the Ottawa Centre this year was our ability to continue to offer meetings uninterrupted uh, once, co once COVID hit us and, and throughout, throughout, uh, th throughout COVID. So thanks to Dave Chisholm, thanks to Chris Tarrant, thanks to Jenna Hines at, uh, at the National uh, Office for, for, for making this happen. I, I think many of you can agree that um, it, our meetings, are, our monthly meetings are, are a source of pride uh, for us, they're brimming with uh, interesting speakers, uh, interesting topics, um, dazzling astro images. So for us to continue to to um, to, to go forward with the, the, the monthly meetings, well, that's an achievement. So you know, well, well done, everyone. Uh, public outreach. Uh, well, so this year, public outreach, and particularly the public star parties, we didn't host them. All right, there were too many too many risks presented to our, our to our members. And, uh, and, to, and, to, and to our guests. So this, this is, uh, it's, it's sad, I know for many of us, it may very well be the first time in our, in our uh, since our center was founded in 1906 that th this has happened. But um, I know our centers, our, our, our public stargazing program in particular will come back with a roar. We've had, we've had a lot of, um, of inquiries about our public star parties, even throughout, the, th throughout COVID. And I think that's uh, something not just about our public star parties, and the program we offer, but about our, our uh, former public um, star, uh, star party uh, coordinator, uh, Paul Sadler. So, um, so, 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 you know, well done to all of us. Um, wanted to also say something about, uh, you may recall last year, Dave Chisholm, I, in, in, my, uh, in my 2019 report, I talked about Dave, Dave Chisholm's uh, prolific outreach, uh, uh, you know, effort. Uh, he had done many, many uh, outreach programs to, to, um, uh, to, you know, to, to scouts, to, uh, to uh, uh, girl guides, to various uh, school groups and, and so forth. Well, Dave did again in spades in, in 2020. I'll just read here. He, um, the full, the full uh, transcript is in, the, uh, in, in, the, um, in my report in the, uh, that'll appear in Astronauts. He, de he, he delivered uh, 32 outreach events. Okay, or, or touching so, uh, over 600 people, and he re and, and in recognition of that, he was recently um, recognized with a uh, uh, an award by a accommodation by Scouts Canada. So, Dave, I'm not the only one, but you know, you know, well, well, well done, Dave. I mean, uh, you're you're awesome. Um, you're a machine, but uh, you leave uh, many. You're you're going to leave many um, uh, young people, let's say, with uh, with warm memories that'll last a lifetime. Uh, members program. Let me say a few things about that. So in late spring, uh, many of you may uh, remember uh, that we, um, many of you had the pleasure of attending Paul, uh, Paul Clowinger's uh, online astrophotography course. Paul worked for months and months preparing uh, 
the the uh, for, for the uh, for the workshop. And as you know, Paul is a, 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 a gifted uh, you know a communicator and obviously a very experienced uh, astrophotographer. Paul, um, on the the course feedback was entirely uh, entirely positive. Thank you, Paul. Um, Going on, I wanted to also say a couple of things about uh, somebody who probably doesn't get, receive a lot of credit, and that's our Ottawa Centre um, webmaster, uh, you know, um, 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 Mick, um, Mick uh, Wilson. So Mick works uh, tirelessly behind the scenes. He's made a, for a very stable uh, website. Now, obviously, if the website goes down, all right, we all know about it, but when it's running and working well, um, we really don't comment on it. So, so Mick has done a lot to make it stable and to make it future proof. And um, I think we're very lucky to, ha to have him. So Mick, uh, I really appreciate what you've done. Thank you. Um, Fred Lossing uh, Observatory Site Enhancements. So uh, Rick is gonna talk a little bit about that later on. So I don't wanna to say too much, but I just wanted to remind everyone that um, the, the site that we use, there's a, it's, a, it's a, uh, a site that we leased from the Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority. We signed a five-year lease. In spite of the challenges presented by COVID, there was some infrastructure work that was done um, for, for, for the benefit of observers. We continued to make some uh, um, enhancements and maintenance. Uh, again, Rick, Rick will talk a lot about that uh, as, as director of, this, of the site. Um, wanted to say a few words about the Dominion Observatory, uh, uh, um, the group that's uh, working to preserve the Dominion Observatory site. So um, as many of you know, this is a site of national historic um, significance. Uh, we're fortunate to have in the Ottawa Centre a very active, very focused, very dedicated group, uh, including, which includes uh, Sharon O'Dell, uh, includes uh, Doug, uh, Doug O'Brien, uh, Neil O'Brien, and, and Michael Wolfson. And each one of them are really, they, they remain steadfast in their, in their, um, in, in their belief that this, this site, it's, it's uh, the facilities and the contents are worth, are worth preserving. So thank you. Wanted to say that this group is, is uh, focused this year on, or has been focused this year on obtaining Heritage Canada status uh, for the, uh, for the, uh, the site the, and the facilities and so, and, and so on. And, uh, they, and what they've done is they've actually obtained a lot of the documentation from the group that that um, obtain heritage kind of status for, for um, the uh, David Dunlop observatory in, in, in Toronto. So, so some sad news before I conclude, um, uh, you may remember the announcement from, from uh, earlier in the air about uh, Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Higgs. So Dr. Higgs was a very prominent member of the uh, RASC. He was a, he was a, uh, a Rhodes Scholar and a, re a very respected astronomer. In, um, and uh, he was a uh, he was very active in the Ottawa Center when he joined the Ottawa Center in the in the uh, late '60s, and he became uh, uh, Ottawa Center president in '71, '72, and then the National Society president in in, in '88 uh, to '90. He's always was an enthusiastic supporter of the RASC, um, and sad it was you know it's it was sad news that we uh, that we had to announce this, we announced his passing. So finally, um, I wanted to say thanks uh, to uh, to everyone. I'm at the end of my two-year term as uh, as Ottawa Center uh, president. I've enjoyed the experience, and I've worked hard to uh, to advance the center. Um, and I can assure you that your council is is um, is also filled with very talented people who are also interested in um, or filled with talented people who are also very uh, committed to um, to advancing the center as well. So I, uh, I've enjoyed that. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Stephen, uh, Stephen Norris. You'll hear shortly that he's going to be the, the next president of the Ottawa, uh, the, uh, Ottawa Center. Uh, he's a very thoughtful, experienced leader, and I find him also very resourceful. I would love to share some exciting news that he, that he shared with uh, Ottawa, the, uh, the council uh, recently, but that's really up to him to, uh, to share that news. And, and the, so I'm excited about that and uh, all the best, Stephen. Uh, so on behalf of Ottawa Center Council, I, I wish everyone a, a healthy, and a, uh, a happy 2021 with clear skies, lots of observing opportunities and, uh, and hopefully return to public stargazing. So thank you. Yeah. Eight minutes there, Dave. Great. So over to you, uh, David, uh, with your treasurer's report. Okay, so um, yes, yeah, so this is the treasurer report. Uh, the the fun part of the, uh, the meeting, maybe. Uh, so we'll, we'll get on with that one. 
Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So our uh, auditor has been through the 2019 uh, fiscal year and <clears throat> I'm happy to report that everything was good. Uh, it was uh, uh, a true reflection of our financial position. Uh, so um, thank you very much uh, to, uh, to Janice for that one. And on to the income statement. So uh, our revenue uh, this year was uh, 23,039. Uh, this uh, a, a bit higher than, well, a good bit higher than last year, uh, mainly due to uh, uh, donations of a, a, a telescope and, um, oh, sorry, uh, and a, um, yeah. I'm just trying to think of here. I'm stuck here. Uh, oh yes, yeah, sorry. The uh, the uh, astrophysics refractor and a celestron mount. Um, our cost of goods was down significantly from last year. That's because uh, normally it would include um, calendar um, sales. Uh, sorry, calendar purchases. Uh, we did the calendar purchases this year in November, so that will show up in uh, next year's financials, not this year. Uh, our operating uh, costs are pretty much the same, just a, a small increase. And that gives us a, a net income of $9,379. Um, now that is actually um, largely due to uh, donations our, our donations uh, are, are around $9,000. So almost all of our net income this year is uh, the result of donations. Uh, depreciation, uh, well, depreciation uh, also went up over last year. Again, that is uh, because of uh, donated equipment. Um, it's also uh, part of that is uh, work that we did at Flow this year. And a little bit actually comes from uh, last year's uh, purchase of equipment that was depreciated in this year. That's our, that's our income. So uh, our income uh, before depreciation is $13,457. Uh, next slide, please. And that takes us to the, uh, the balance sheet. Our uh, assets are $62,540. That's up a little bit from, from last year. That's uh, mainly um, investments. Uh, let's increase that. Our capital assets, as I mentioned, we, we had uh, donations of equipment of, uh, of uh, $6,000. So that, uh, that takes uh, um, care of most of that. And that leaves us with total assets of $87,918. Our liabilities are, are zero. We, we paid all our bills. Uh, so we have retained earnings of 87,918 and total liabilities of 87,918. Uh, during the year, uh, we council decided to set up a internally restricted fund uh, for uh, members who are finding it difficult to pay their membership due to uh, COVID. So council put in $300. We had a donation of $250. And during the year we paid out the, the membership for one of our members, uh, leaving us a balance of that fund for So uh, our, let's move down here just a little bit here. Uh, okay, so our, our membership revenue went up a little bit um, from year to year, uh, mainly because we did a, a fee increase that, that took care of um, pretty much all of that. Uh, our operational expenses uh, increased just a little bit, not much. And our depreciation, as I explained, went up because of of uh, uh, increased uh, assets. Um, our uh, club uh, 
is doing is doing well. There, it it is, uh, in my opinion, financially viable. Everything is looking good. We have a good number of members. We have a, a good bit of uh, assets, so everything is good and healthy there. For our uh, for this year, uh, we uh, um, Janice cannot continue as uh, as auditor, uh, so. Uh, we had uh, kindly uh, Paul uh, Sadler has volunteered to be the uh, auditor for uh, this this year. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. We really appreciate that. And Sorry, David, before proceeding to uh, the auditor, we uh, you may have some questions. I, though I don't see any, and okay. we do uh, need yes. to are approve the questions? financial statements. <laughs> sure. All right. So, are there any questions? Let's yeah, get that part. If there are any questions, please type them in the Q&A box. I don't see any questions coming in, so I move to approve the statements, uh, seconded by Chris Tarrin. Anybody objecting? Type it in the Q&A box, please. We seem to be good to go. Thank you very much. Next slide. And now we just have uh, Paul Sadler to mention as the auditor. Okay. Anybody object to Paul being the auditor? If you do, you become auditor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> okay. I don't see anything in the Q&A box. We will move on. Fred Lawson Observatory. Okay. Hang on a second here. Okay. There we go. Thanks, Dave. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound great. Um, this will be a very short summary version of my full report that I presented to Council this past October. For more information about FLO, you can always read my article in the August 2020 edition of Astronauts if you didn't see it. For those of you who are new members or are unfamiliar with FLO, it's located at 365 Benny's Corners Road, which is between Elmont and Pakenham. Um, it's on land owned by the Provincial Conservation Authority, so it's, it's quite secure and well-maintained, as, uh, as Mike had mentioned. Being about 40 kilometers west of Ottawa Centre, it's, uh, it's a bit of a drive unless you happen to live in the West End, but you are rewarded with reasonably dark skies, thanks in part to the lighting bylaws that are in place in Mississippi Mills. And I'll mention that the access lane and walkways are cleared of snow throughout the winter, so it's usable 12 months of the year. Um, use of uh, the FLO site is, and the warm room is, is an Ottawa RASC member privilege. So anybody is entitled to use the site. Uh, any member is, is free to bring their own gear to the site or use one of the small telescopes that are located in the warm room. There's a 10 inch daub and a six inch uh, reflector in there. Guidelines for using the site are posted on our website under the uh, Ottawa Center tab as a uh, as Chris is showing here. So there's a tab for FLO there and there's a full set of guidelines. And I would encourage, even if you're already a site user to please read these guidelines, just to make sure you're fully up to date on, on the latest developments. Now, the main, uh, the main telescope at, uh, at the site is an 18 inch Starmaster Daub. It was no, donated, uh, generously donated by Mike Worths and it was installed in 2017. Optically, it is a, a very good telescope, as, uh, as many people who've used it will attest to. And I'm sure you've seen some photographs taken through it uh, at some of the meetings. To use it, a member, however, must be trained and pay a small uh, maintenance fee of $30 per year. The list of qualified users at the moment is, uh, is only 10 people, so there's lots of bandwidth for, for more users if you're interested. And I do have a, a short list of uh, people who are who are wanting to be trained and, and we get to it when we can on clear nights when schedules permit. Also, we hope to have two more large telescopes available for use in 2021. And that's depending on, on the two C's, contractors and COVID. So uh, you can see in the picture here, the, uh, the nice drone shot that Chris Terran took of the site with the expanded south observing mound, which is showing as a patch of dirt at the moment, but it has been seeded and it'll be use ready for use in the spring. And we have a, uh, 
a sky shed pod on a deck with a C14 in it, and hopefully a, a dome uh, set up with a, a six inch refractor in it next year. Um, finally, I'll just mention that Flow is the site of our uh, monthly Ottawa members star parties, and Gordon Wempster announces these events using the RASC Ottawa mailing list. They're held on the Saturday closest to the new moon. In good weather, the attendance is typically five to 15 people. So there's plenty of room to spread out around the parking lot and on the two observing mounds we have now. For further information and any questions, you can always contact me at flo at ottawa.rast.ca and that email address is also on the tab on our, on our website. And that's it, unless there are questions. Okay, are there any uh, questions? No, nope. okay, I gotta turn it back over to Mike. Just give me a second here. Okay, let's now talk about the, uh, the elections. Um, so next slide, please. All right, thank you. So um, the slate that you see on the, uh, of, of, of um, people you see on this uh, slide here were nominated by the nominating committee. Um, we did not receive any more further nominations, so these people are therefore acc acclaimed. Uh, you'll notice that uh, you'll notice that uh, we do have a uh, open position for a, a national councillor rep. Uh, if anyone is interested, uh, please talk to um, to uh, any member that you see uh, on this list here. Stephen Norris, in, in, in particular, can can invite can provide guidance. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So there are some appointed positions, positions appointed by council. You'll notice a couple of, uh, of gaps, um, uh, light pollution abatement uh, 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 coordinator. That position has been open for a while and uh, we were still very much interested in, in, uh, in filling that position. If you are interested, we can share with you um, uh, what's, what's all involved and, and, uh, and uh, and the importance of that, 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 very, uh, that very important position. Um, public star parties, the star season coordinator. Wow, that's in a really important one. And, and we, um, after, after many years of, of, uh, of support and, uh, and coordination by Paul Sadler, um, we, we, uh, Paul has is, 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 is moved on and he's contributing in other ways, as you can see here uh, on, the, on the previous slide. Um, but we, uh, our public star gazing program is sort of a bread and butter um, uh, uh, activity offered by our center, which we've we do, done really well. If anyone has any questions about contributing, uh, you know, as the coordinator or even in a part-time role, please reach out to um, to Paul Sadler. I know he'll be happy to answer questions. Myself, obviously, um, and, uh, and 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 uh, and of course uh, uh, the the president and uh, vice president uh, uh, Stephen and and um, and and Dave Dave Chisholm. Okay. Go to the next slide. Okay, back to you, Dave. Okay. Okay, folks. So uh, as the meeting chair, uh, I have the pleasure of announcing the uh, 2020 Call Commission Observer of the Year Award. Uh, this is uh, based upon uh, entries that I have received and, and observations that we've received through the year. And the winner this year is Paul Cloninger. Congratulations, Paul. There we Thank go. Thank you, Dave. Much appreciated. Okay, so your uh, your plaque is uh, in the mail. Well, I think it's still in the shop. We're, we're having a few challenges getting them made, but we will get it to you. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Thanks again. The Rolf Meyer Award for Planetary Observing goes to Taras Rabarski. And congratulations, Taras. Uh, there's some amazing uh, planetary images that you uh, have presented to us. So congratulations on that one. And the best presentation of the year. And this was a lot of people gave me very positive feedback on this presentation. So the presentation is Jeremy Kazub, a year of Aurora chasing. So congratulations, Jeremy. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Uh, Gordon, just give me a second. I'm good. I just have to highlight you. You're in here someplace. Got all these people. There's Gordon. You need to turn your uh, video on, Gordon. There we okay. Go. So the astronaut article that caught my attention uh, this year was one where the writing was was lyrical, poetic, and enchanting. It described an astronomical event in such beautiful prose. It made it fairly easy. Uh, made it a fairly easy choice, even though we had some really well written um, and compelling articles from others. The other thing that struck me with this article was that. This was not the author's first language. Daytime Venus by Taras Rabarsky appeared in the May issue of Astronauts and it describes Taras's hunt for Venus in the bright daylight. Congratulations, Taras. Okay, Mike, you're on. Okay, well, I have the, uh, the, uh, the honor of recognizing two members with service awards this, this year. Um, the first service award goes to the next slide, please, to, to Rick Scholes. Rick, you've done an uh, amazing job over uh, several years um, uh, uh, maintaining the, the flow site, advancing the flow site. It's the day-to-day -day things that you do that you don't see recognition for. You're, 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 always, you're a very humble person. Um, you, you promote flow, and uh, we just all want to say thank you. Um, you, you uh, you're very much deserving of this uh, of this recognition. Okay, the next slide, please. So the next award goes to um, a recognition goes to Gordon Webster. So Gordon Webster is all many of you know has been a tireless promoter of of, uh, of flow as well. He's uh, done a, just a stellar job on on, on astronauts. Uh, former president, very active member, um, a I would say a counsel to to myself as a, you know as a, as a former president. He gave me some really great advice and, and support um, uh, in in the, my earlier days, and uh, he's just uh, I feel very strongly that uh, he deserves our recognition uh, for for his ongoing contributions to our center. So thanks, Gordon. Thank you, Mike. It's really appreciated. Okay. Other business, um, Chris. Uh, is this uh, other business? Is there any other business from uh, what was the section about again? I've forgotten. Just if, it, if there is other business that people want to bring up, but right. I have not seen anything. If there is something that is urgent that we need to deal with at the EGM, please quickly type it into the Q and A. Otherwise, we're going to move forward to the uh, the next slide and adjournment. Okay, we have a motion by David. Seconded by Chris Terran that we adjourn. And I don't see any objections. So thank you very much, folks. And uh, we're going to move on to the uh, rest of the uh, rest of the meeting. There we go. Okay, we have uh, members in the news. And uh, so congratulations to uh, Robert Millard at the Ottawa Centre, who has achieved the Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program. He received uh, this award on the 13th of November in 2020. Next slide. The Astronomical League 2021 calendar in the month of January, one of our members has their picture as the main picture for January. You can zoom in on the next slide here. And it is Teres. Congratulations, Teres, having your your image published in this calendar. And uh, I received a certificate of commendation for a uh, outreach that I did to three different uh, groups or three different sections of the same group in Montreal for scouts. So uh, uh, anyways, that's uh, part of the outreach that I do. I do a lot of outreach to scouts and guides and so on this year. And particularly with the groups being locked out as they are, uh, not being able to, to meet in person, having something different virtually is uh, much appreciated. Okay, next slide. Okay, so you need to get your pens and papers out here and see if you can uh, record this, uh, this long URL. No, just kidding. Um, I did send this out as an email to the group. 
this is a, a really good interview that was done on, on CBC. And uh, please just check your email. It's about the challenges of a pandemic, uh, doing observing during the pandemic. Uh, they do mention RASIC as part of this, uh, of this interview. And we had uh, Tristan Young from, uh, from Focus Scientific. And I'm, I, I should have written the other fellow's name down. Chris, do you remember who the other fellow was? Yeah, uh, Prajesh Joshi. Pra yeah, sorry, Prajesh. Uh, so th those two were, uh, were were being interviewed. Very, very good. They really sort of put things in perspective. So I encourage you to listen to that. And again, I sent out this long link. If you're not on the email distribution list, uh, you can email myself, um, uh, meeting chair at ottawa.rasc.ca, and I'll send it out to you. Or just ask one of the other members here. They'll forward it to you. Okay, next slide. So we had 65 new members in 2020, and we the new members in the last month are, are up on the screen here. And uh, congratulations uh, to our newest members for, for joining the RASC, and hopefully uh, we'll see you with some of your observations and, and maybe as meeting chair, maybe you can give me a talk at some point in time. That, that would be really appreciated. Okay, next screen. Okay, we're going to take a look at the Ottawa skies. And uh, just a second here. Okay, so uh, these are the uh, moon phases for the month. We have a full moon on the uh, 31st of December. Sorry, the 30th of December. And um, this full moon is has been known as the cold moon. It's also been known as the long night's moon and the moon before Yule. We have a new moon on the uh, 14th. Next slide. We have uh, uh, two meteor showers this month. First one is the Geminids meteor shower. And this one occurs on the 13th and 14th. Um, we're about 120 meteors per hour. And uh, the, the morning of the 15th could almost be nearly as active this year. The nearly new moon will ensure dark skies, which should be an excellent show. And you can see where it, it, it appears to be coming from. from uh, on the sky there. Next one, we have the Ursids meteor shower. Now we've got two things happening on the 21st. So not only do you get the Ursids meteor shower, we're also gonna have the great conjunction of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. I'll talk about that in just a minute. So this is where the Ursids uh, come from. So you just sort of see it's between the Big Dipper and, and Polaris. That's where you're gonna see the region for that one. That one is a, uh, a slightly smaller meteor shower, but I've been told that it might be a little bit more intense this year. And uh, normally it's five to 10 meteors per hour. And it's left behind by the uh, comet uh, Tuttle. Okay, next slide. I think this is our, our big event for the month. So uh, the great conjunction of, of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, the last time that they were this close together was back in the 1600s. So this is a very rare event. And they're seven arc minutes apart. So that is, uh, something that hopefully we will have clear sky. So just after sunset in the Western sky, uh, take a look and uh, you'll see it looks like uh, they'll be very, very close together. Easily seen with binoculars, even better seen with, uh, with a telescope. Okay, next slide. So we also have in early January, uh, we have the Quantrids meteor shower and around 40 meteors per hour. Um, being that we've just come out of a full moon at the end of December, it's gonna be a little bit uh, washed out by the moon. Um, and the reason I'm putting it in our December slides is that our next meeting is not until January the 8th. Uh, Friday is, uh, January 1st is a Friday, so we bump our meeting out by, uh, by one week. So I wouldn't want you to miss a, a meteor shower. Okay, next slide, please. So we can see the uh, sunrise and sunset. The days are getting shorter and then they start getting longer towards the end of the month after the uh, 21st of December. Next one. Mercury is uh, really sort of too close to the sun. So it's really not visible. Venus is visible before sunrise and uh, Mars is visible in the evening and through the night. Jupiter is visible in the early evening. And we, of course, we have the rare conjunction with Saturn on December the 21st. 
Saturn is visible in the early evening, and all, again, we have that uh, conjunction. Uranus is visible all night, and Neptune is visible all evening. And there is our cartoon of the month. Wouldn't that be a drag? I forgot to turn it on. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, section. Oh, yes. So uh, one of the things I do on a fairly regular basis is I have a 45-minute program for Beavers and Sparks and one hour, about a one-hour, 15-minute program for all other groups. And uh, I deliver it using a secure Zoom session. And uh, so if you know any scouting or guiding groups or any youth groups, um, any you know any grade six teachers, they're doing astronomy this year. I've, I've reached out to one of the grade six classes this year. And uh, it's just basically a, a high level introduction to astronomy. Uh, just contact me and uh, I'm, I'm fully booked now until the new year. Uh, but I do have some space in G January through March. So just get in touch with me and uh, I'll be happy to set something up for you. Now we have a very special event coming up this Sunday. I have sent the invite, I sent the invite out about a week ago uh, uh, on Sunday. I will be sending it out again uh, either later tonight or first thing tomorrow morning. We're really pleased to have Dr. Fair Alibay uh, speak to us. She is one of the folks who's been working on the uh, Mars rover, and she'll be one of the folks actually driving the rover once it uh, lands on Mars in, in February this year. And we've been able to get her to come to speak to us. It's a joint session between the uh, Montreal Centre and the Ottawa Centre, the RESC. And it's because uh, the Montreal Centre has a large youth component, we want to make sure that they could uh, participate in this as well. So we're having it start at five o'clock, on, uh, on Sunday, and it will run for about an hour and 15 minutes. And I really encourage you to come to this talk. It's it will be uh, quite fascinating. So I have sent out the link uh, to uh, everybody who's on our distribution list. For those of you who are visitors here, if you go to ottawa.resc.ca, it's right on our website there. The link is right there to register. It's a webinar, just like we have tonight. I really encourage you to, uh, to watch the session. Simon Hamner, I'm just going to highlight you. Just give me a second here. I'm pleased to have Simon as our first speaker here this evening. And just give me a second. I don't see Simon. He's on my other screen. Oh, he just appeared. Hang on a second. There we go. You there, Simon? I'm here. There we go. So I think you are spotlighted. Yes, you are. Super. Okay. And Simon, you prefer to um, yeah, I'll run it share from your my screen. End. Yeah, that's right. It's there we go. All yours to share. All right, let's see how I do. There we go. And then, do I take it you can see screen and cursor? Yeah, yes, but we're, we're we're also seeing all your slides on the side, so you need to, to run. Okay, well, let's get rid of that. We'll deal with that immediately. There we go. Perfect. There we go, excellent. Now, I just want to get rid of you, smiling faces. How do I do that? Just minimize the, uh, hover over oh, the boxes just see. minimize them, yeah. I got you. And then just drag okay. it out of Actually, the way. I'll just get, 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 get rid of all of them, how about that? Okay. Well, welcome to December meeting. We're at the end of 2020. And during 2019 and 2020, I've given presentations at this now virtual podium on the rapidly evolving state of scientific inquiry regarding the Moon, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, placing, I think, clear emphasis on the big picture and glossing over the details. And tonight, I'd like to turn the spotlight on the planet that's obviously missing from this list, which would be, of course, the Earth. So, okay, as many of you know, I'm a geologist and I could drone on for hours about the Earth, but rest assured, I promise I won't. But I really think it's time for us to look at the Earth as a planet. I look at it as a planet through the eyes of planetary scientists who are just discovering it for the first time. So to ensure that I don't get sidetracked by any of my favorite geological topics, 
I'm going to change the presentation format tonight and let somebody else talk. My role will be to act as a narrator, but narrator of what? Narrator of an imaginary tale of planetary exploration by extraterrestrial planetary scientists who are on their way somewhere else in the galaxy and who by chance stumble upon our solar system. They quickly realize that as planets go, there's something rather special about the third rock from the sun. After all, it, it has life. However, given that they're already behind schedule, they can only spare 30 minutes to check it out. About the same time as I have to tell you what they discovered. So to speed things up, they decided to eavesdrop, eavesdrop on terrestrial planetary scientists to see what they have discovered about their own planet during the two centuries or so that they've been studying it. And to find out where the terrestrials are, where they're at in their evaluation of Earth as a planet in 2020. So just to make sure that everybody realizes this is an imaginary tale. But the science I'll talk to you about is not. So our extraterrestrials are pushed for time, so they have to focus their inquiry, just like we do. And given that Earth hosts life, they decide to look to terrestrial planetary scientists for answers to the following big picture questions about this planet. How and when did a breathable planetary atmosphere evolve? How and when did the planetary magnetic field that predicts, predict, protects that atmosphere develop? What kind of internal motions, convection technically speaking, generated the magnetic field throughout the history of that planet? And given that the answers to these questions involve the secular cooling of the planetary interior, including plate tectonics, they asked, how and when did plate tectonics start? And when did the continents that are sitting on those plates and host most of the evolved life forms develop and grow? Now, our extraterrestrial visitors are asking these questions because they're curious. But why are terrestrial planetary scientists asking exactly the same questions in 2020? Quite simply because Earth is the template against which we measure and interpret all rocky planets. If we can't understand how the Earth developed, then how can we understand Mercury, Venus, Mars, and the Moon? So what did our intrepid terrestrial explorers, extraterrestrial explorers, discover when they listened in on our planetary scientists in 2020? Let's find out. Starting with the planetary atmosphere. Now, they were initially intrigued by these artistic apocalyptic visions of the early earth with all that fire and brimstone. But these images did not tell them anything about the composition of the early atmosphere, which is important because without atmospheric oxygen, there wouldn't be much fire at all, even if there was brimstone. Now our extraterrestrial explorers soon found out that Earth-based scientists are well aware of this, and they have a pretty good understanding of what the early terrestrial atmosphere must have looked like chemically. And that's something which we've illustrated here on the right-hand side. The early atmosphere is here. This is the Earth's prebiotic atmosphere. Lots of carbon dioxide, methane, that's the CH4 over here. Uh, the ammonia, which is the NH3 hiding up here and H2O and even some carbon monoxide. But no free oxygen. This is what's referred to as a reducing environment. Of course, they also know that today's planetary atmosphere, which we'll see over here on this side, is oxidizing with lots of free oxygen there, right there, and less of the reducing stuff. But the question is, how and when did the oxidized atmosphere evolve? Now, our extraterrestrials also discovered that most Earth-based scientists agree that it happened in a series of steps rather than as a simple progression. And you can see that over here on this side. And just so that you're, uh, you're oriented, time goes from 4.5 billion on the left, and it gets younger going to the right to the present day. 
Now, the first big step in oxygenation of our, our atmosphere, this one here, occurred at about two and a half billion years ago, and it's referred to as the great oxygenation event. Now, the extraterrestrials found it interesting to watch the evolution of that atmospheric oxygen. This is the green curve here. You can see the evolution through time going up and then down and then coming up stepwise this way to where we are today. They noticed how it rises at 2.5 billion and then falls back somewhat. And then it seems to stay at about the same level for the next 1 billion years. As I say, time goes from older to younger, from left to right. They also notice that land plants, that's up here, land plants come in very late in the story, about 400 million years ago. Forests may well be the planetary lungs today, the lungs of the planet, but it was microscopic oceanic bacteria and algae that played the role that, 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 that role during most of the oxygenation of the planet's atmosphere. Now, how do Earth-based planetary scientists know that a great oxygen, uh, oxygenation event occurred at two and a half billion years ago? And again, in these diagrams, time will go from older on the left to younger on the right. They know because geologists tell them that before that time, before the great oxygenation event, there were gravel deposits full of these pyrite pebbles. Pyrite is what's known as fool's gold, and it's a sulfide. And it would have rusted to simple iron oxide rust in the presence of atmospheric oxygen. They also know that they can find these things here called banded iron formations. This is one of my field photographs. This made of, of, uh, of uh, basically iron oxide bands in the gray, and then the white uh, silica or chert bands. And these would have formed only if the ocean water that they formed in was very oxygen poor. Now, after the great oxygenation event here, uh, <clears throat> geologists have also found lots of rusty red sandstones and shales, which they call red beds, and they occur after the great oxygenation event. And they're proof of the presence of atmospheric oxygen, which therefore rusted the, the iron hanging around in the sandstones and the shales at the time. So great, said the extraterrestrials. So what's the problem? And the problem is called the boring billion. And that's this thing here, the boring billion years when apparently nothing much was happening, at least not into the atmosphere. Now, according to most Earth-based planetary scientists who envisage this, the oxygen level fell back a bit after the great oxygenation event and simply stayed that way until the first recognizable animals started to turn up in the fossil record, which would have been about here. You can see photosynthetic life, but there's also other fossil life in what's called the Phanerozoic after about 500 million years ago. And that, of course, suggested uh, no, sorry, um, but our extraterrestrial uh, uh, visitors soon discovered these diagrams over here that other planetary scientists see things somewhat differently. Starting with the observation that immediately after the great oxygenation event, supposedly here, roundabouts in this area here, that the th th metals that are particularly sensitive to the presence of atmospheric oxygen started turning up in quantities very similar to what we find today. And they're indicated by here, this is molybdenum, if you've heard of that, uranium, uh, more uranium of different isotopic composition, and rhenium. And if you compare these lines here, they're very similar to these, uh, the, these compositions, which are much more recent and in fact, even present day suggesting that there was actually a lot of oxygen around after the great oxygenation event, that it didn't just collapse. Now, the extraterrestrials were not quite sure what to make of all this, but things got even more complicated when they learned that still other studies show that there was, in fact, a lot of variation in the level of atmospheric oxygen all the way through the boring billion. Here's the boring billion right there. And look at the variation in atmospheric oxygen that's shown here. There's the boring billion shown down here. But it's really just smoothing out these various changes. 
And these variations that you can see here, going up and down, up and down, they were caused either by biological or geological processes. And again, time gets younger as you move to the right. So maybe the boring billion wasn't so boring after all. So, okay, we've got a planetary atmosphere, but atmospheres need a protective shield to prevent erosion by the solar wind. And that means a planetary magnetic field. And the big issue here is just how do you do that? Now, I'm pretty sure that you all know that the Earth's ma ma magnetic field today is generated by convection in the planet's core. And the core is indicated here. And this is a, a, a diagram to illustrate the magnetic field around the Earth cut open to reveal the core. Today's core in the Earth is divided into two parts, a solid inner part and a liquid outer part. The solid inner core that crystallized out of a liquid core as the Earth as a planet cooled over geological time. Now, the general idea is that the lower part of the, of the liquid core, the liquid outer core, rises because it's hotter and less dense than the upper part of the liquid core. And that it's this thermally driven convection that in part drives the Earth's dynamo. The other part of the driving force for convection is the crystallization of dense iron to form the solid inner core in the first place, leaving a less dense liquid residue that can rise. And this process is known as chemical or compositional convection. Now, all of this is critical for the planet's atmosphere because the magnetic field deflects the solar wind generated by the sun that would otherwise strip the lighter gases such as hydrogen and oxygen, of course, water is H2O, so that's included in there too, and leave the planet both barren and dry. The planet's magnetic field also shields life from the cosmic and other electromagnetic rays emanating from the sun and allowed life to develop on the early Earth. So what's the problem? Well, it turns out that the early Earth was probably too hot as a planet for a solid core to crystallize. And therefore, according to calculations, the core could not have driven a planetary dynamo prior to about one billion years ago. The problem is that some Earth-based scientists claim to have evidence for the existence of a planetary magnetic field prior to four billion years ago. Well, said the extraterrestrials, what exactly is this evidence? And the evidence is zircons. Zircons, there's an illustration here of a zircon seen down the microscope. It's a zircon crystal. Zircon, which is zirconium silicate, forms really tough crystals that crystallize in hot molten magma. And they end up in sediments like sandstone when the magmatic or igneous rock gets eroded. While they're crystallizing and cooling, impurities of iron in the crystals line up with the planetary magnetic field that was present at the time the zircons formed in the first place. The zircons also contain traces of uranium and that breaks down to lead over time. So a zircon crystal in an old sandstone presents us with both a clock and a magnetic compass. But how do Earth-based scientists know that the magnetic field recorded in the zircon crystals isn't due to some later disturbance? How do they know that it doesn't represent a younger superimposed magnetic field, maybe even a very recent magnetic field? Well, just like there's an app for everything, there's a method to answer that question. The images shown here on the left they show you a zircon crystal. That's the, in a circle there, that's a green, green blow up of it. And there it is blown up even more. Surrounded by colorless sand grains. Those are made of quartz. In a sandstone at various magnifications looking down a microscope. Now we can measure both the age of crystallization of the zircon crystal and the orientation of the magnetic field that it contains. So how old is the magnetic field in the zircon grain? Well, we have no idea. But if we looked at lots of zircon grains in our sandstone, we can answer that question very easily. Now, I'm going to illustrate that by analogy with this picture here over on the right. It's a picture of pebbles in a conglomerate 
It's a rock, but they made, it's made of pebbles. Now, the pebbles, they're easier to see than the zircon and easier to conceive of. So it's why I, I want to use this as an analogy. They formed by rolling around in water before finally coming to rest in the conglomerate deposit, maybe a pebble beach, for example, and turning into a rock. Now, imagine that we measure the orientation of the magnetic field contained within each of the pebbles of this picture, in this picture. If the magnetic field is differently oriented from pebble to pebble, then the magnetism was imposed on each pebble before each pebble ended up in the conglomerate because they got rolled around in the water before they ended up in on the beach, for example. That means the planetary magnetic field must be older than the age of formation of the conglomerate. The pebbles acquired their magnetism before they ended up rolled around and dropped into the conglomerate. But if the magnetic fields in the pebbles are all aligned in the same direction, then the magnetism was imposed on the pebbles after they ended up in the conglomerate. So the planetary magnetic field must be younger than the age of formation of the conglomerate. So what about our sandstone with its included zircon grains over here? Well, the uranium lead clocks in the zircons tell us that the zircons formed at about 4 billion years ago. And the magnetic fields in those same zircons are oriented all over the place. They point in every direction you can think of. So the Earth's planetary magnetic field is older than the sandstone deposition and is the same age as the 4 billion year old zircons. It's not magic, it's science. Now, this has led some Earth-based scient uh, planetary scientists to suggest that maybe the magnetic field of the early Earth was entirely driven by chemical or compositional convection in the planetary core. Because as I've just told you, the Earth four billion years ago was considered to be too hot for the solid iron core to have crystallized. Now, in order to make this compositional convection work, they turn the classical dynamo model on its head. That's over here. This is the mantle, and this is the outer part of the liquid core. And they suggest that magnesium-rich minerals crystallize at the top of the liquid core. And since magnesium is less dense than iron, it rises to the core mantle boundary. That's these grains rising here with these arrows. And the residual liquid that remains behind is enriched in iron, which is dense, and so that liquid begins to sink, and you can see that sinking here. Hence, you get convection and a magnetic field, but without a thermal contribution. Our extraterrestrial visitors were quite impressed by this workaround. However, they quickly learned that there are other ideas on the table too. For example, the Earth's planetary mantle is solid today, though it does convect very, very slowly. But what if the lower mantle in the early Earth had been liquid and capable of relatively rapid motion and relatively rapid convection? Maybe it would have been capable of generating a planetary magnetic field. This is one of the new theories of 2020. Who knows? Certainly, the extraterrestrial planetary scientists were perplexed, and that's putting it mildly. So, okay, while we're on the topic of convection, this is pretty important stuff. After all, if you're going to prevent a planet from melting due to heat buildup from the breakdown of radioactive elements such as uranium, thorium, and potassium inside, you need to get the heat out. And convection of the planetary core and mantle would be important components in that process. Well, having just looked at core convection, our extraterrestrial visitors turned their attention to the planetary mantle. What do Earth-based scientists know about mantle convection within the Earth? Well, our visitors soon found out that there are two principal schools of thought. That doesn't mean there aren't more, just two principal ones, both of which are well supported. One school says that the entire mantle shown here, going from lower mantle to upper mantle, that the entire mantle is a single convection system with hot plumes rising from the core mantle boundary. Hot, whoa, I didn't want to do that. Let me go back one. There we go. Hot plumes rising up here like this through the entire uh, um, a mantle. And cold slabs of crust, up of, of crust coming from here, going down in subduction zones 
all the way down, right the way down to the core mantle boundary. The other school of thought says, no way, which when you think about it is confusing even for an extraterrestrial planetary scientist. First, they say the upper and lower mantle, that would be lower mantle here, upper mantle. This diagram is divided in two. What I've just shown you, whole mantle convection is shown on this side. That's what we just looked at. And this new school of thought is on this side. And they're saying that the upper mantle here in blue and the lower mantle here in yellow. They're saying that they're not made of the same stuff. Secondly, that the lower mantle in the yellow there is at much higher pressure than the upper mantle in blue. And so it's much stiffer and therefore it moves much more slowly. In short, what they're saying is that the upper and the lower mantle are so different that there's no way they could have mixed. Therefore, they must represent two totally isolated convection systems. Like I said, both schools of thought are well supported. I guess the extraterrestrials get to take their pick. But just when they thought things were getting a little complicated down there, it turns out that Earth-based planetary scientists are not even sure what the boundary between the planetary mantle and the planetary core is really like. This diagram here shows the upper mantle, the lower mantle, and there's the core and the core mantle boundary. And what this segment represents is illustrated by this outline here on a, a, a whole planet. For a while now, Earth-based seismologists, people who look at seismic uh, 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 shaking in the Earth, have been looking at earthquake signals that travel through the lower mantle and the core, and they found some odd looking stuff that seems to be piled up in the lowermost mantle at the core mantle boundary. That's what's illustrated by some of this red here, but actually by these dashed areas here. That's what's represented by that. Uh, this diagram here essentially shows you the Earth's core, but with everything else stripped away, and some of this weird stuff piled up actually on the top of the core. Now, no one disputes that the odd stuff is down there. There are now at least two schools of thought, though, as to what it actually represents. One school says it's piles of subducted oceanic crust that have sunk from the planetary surface. That would be shown here by the blue coming on down, hitting the core mantle boundary, and then starting to pile up. And the idea is it would have come down through the mantle right down to the core, where it piles up as stacks of horizontal layers, assuming, of course, that the entire mantle convects as a whole, which we're not sure of. Now, the, another school of thought says, no, there are no horizontal layers. Instead, what they claim they can see are vertical plumes. That's shown here in the red. Vertical plumes coming off the core mantle boundary. That's the core and there's the mantle. Plumes rising off the core mantle boundary and somehow generating a pile of odd stuff that way. This is the odd stuff being, this is the odd stuff being generated. Their argument is really, is it a pile of light odd stuff or a pile of heavy odd stuff? Uh, come what may, it's all not very obvious, but there it is. That's where things are right now with respect to the core mantle boundary in 2020. Which brings us to parts of the earth as a planet that extraterrestrials can most easily observe, ob ob observe from orbit. And that, of course, would be the planets. Now, sea level is easy to observe, especially from orbit, and it neatly highlights the division of the Earth's planetary crust into high standing continental crust, shown here on the right in the greens, the yellows, and the reds, and low standing oceanic crust. Here it represented in the, the blue. This image is this image with the water taken away. Now, our extraterrestrial visitors could easily see that this division is a direct reflection of the distribution of tectonic plates and what they're individually made of. In other words, there are some plates that are all oceanic and there are some plates that are made of some ocean and some continent and other plates that are mostly continental. But also, but also what we understand as modern style plate tectonics, which is also unique in the solar system. So here we have two intimately linked key planet scale questions. 
at the scale of planetary history. First, when did plate tectonics start? And second, when did the continental crust develop? Now, the extraterrestrial planetary scientists decided to start with the continental crust. Earth-based scientists know from various chemical and isotopic evidence that there's always been some continental, in inverted commas, uh, uh, crust hanging around. The real question is, when was it produced and how much was produced when? This diagram, which some call a spaghetti diagram because it looks like somebody threw a plate of spaghetti at the wall to see how much would stick. This diagram, time gets younger to the, 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 the left this time. There's no convention on this. That's why the diagrams switch back and forth. So old is here on the right and it gets younger to the present day on the left. And it shows you just how little consensus there is among Earth-based scientists, hence the spaghetti. The red curves, that's these ones here, they're from studies that say most continental crust was formed very early in Earth's planetary history. Take this one example. We're, right, we're way before 4 billion years, and it says, look, all of the continental crust formed before 4 billion years, and then it just stayed there. Nothing more formed. That's one point of view. The green curves in the middle here, going up like this in various forms, the stair steps and the smooth ones, uh, they're from studies that say it formed pretty much at the same rate all the way through time. So it formed at the same rate in, in, in ancient time and the same rate in modern time. And the blue curves, which are the ones down here, and especially this one here, I want to draw your attention to with this breaking slope right there. They suggest that continental crust formation started out slowly, initially, slowly, and then accelerated relatively recently, around about one and a half billion years ago, and got going faster. I think they have all the possible bases covered here, but this didn't much help our extraterrestrial visitors, and by now, they're running out of time. So what kind of evidence are we talking about here? Well, it's zircons at center stage yet again. That's these things over here on the left, seen down through microscopes. They have their uranium lead clocks. And they tend to contain other isotope systems like lutetium hafnium that can track the formation of crustal compositions. I'm not gonna get into the details of this diagram, but you can see they've been using lutetium hafnium in the diagram. That's what I put the diagram in there for. You put the two isotope systems together, uranium lead and lutetium hafnium in one crystal and you have a tool that can tell you when continental crust formed. At least it can for the little bit of continental crust that you happen to be studying at the time. Now, this is a very important part of planetary evolution. So it didn't surprise our extraterrestrial visitors to discover that there were lots of lots of different ways of tackling the same question. For example, some Earth-based scientists went looking for the signatures of oxygen isotopes in ancient seawater that's recorded in rocks that precipitated chemically on ancient sea floors. We're talking ancient here from about four and a half billion to about two and a half billion. And th th this is the, the oxygen signature. This is time getting younger to the right. And in the green here, you're looking at uh, uh, representations of oxygen uh, in, in seawater uh, uh, through time. Right, it's complicated and I'm not gonna get into the details, but the point is that these scientists think that they can determine that there really wasn't much exposed continental crust in the earliest part of the earth. They think the continental crust really was mostly developed and exposed above seawater, above sea level in, in younger time. As I say, the details don't concern us. I just want you to know there, there are all these methods. Other Earth-based workers went looking for signs of the actual motion of continents by continental drift, which you'll all have heard of, the phenomenon that pointed to plate tectonics in the first place. And they did this by tracking the orientation of the ancient planetary magnetic field recorded in old rocks. Now, think about this. If you have two areas of volcanic lavas of the same age, let's use this as an example, this diagram here. Uh, pink is one pile and blue is another pile, and they're pretty much next to each other here through time. The time is marked one, two, three, four, five, etc. 
And if, if, if they're neighbors, they're going to record the same planetary magnetic field. These are piles of volcanic lavas with zircon crystallizing in them, by the way. And they show the same orientation for the magnetic poles. If they drift apart by either by rifting, for example, so one continent goes this way and the other one goes this way, they're going to record uh, uh, um, uh, that they're, they're likely to rotate as continents. And if later they come back together again, here they are back again at stage 12. In other words, if two continents were to collide, they would again show the same orientation of magnetic field. So same orientation of magnetic field, same orientation divergence of magnetic field. But they would show different orientations for the planetary magnetic poles in lavas that formed during the time the areas of two areas were apart. So even better, if you can track and date the speed of the evolution of the orientation of the magnetic field in the two volcanic piles, the pink one and the blue one, you can compare the speed at which they're drifting away from each other and coming together again. And you can compare that speed of drifting with more recent plate tectonics. Well, by this method, a group of Earth-based scientists has recently claimed to have found evidence for plate tectonics as old as three and a half to three billion years ago. But of course, much to the frustration of our extraterrestrial visitors in a hurry, others think this is all hooey. And plate tectonics didn't get, and they think that plate tectonics didn't get going in modern fashion until somewhere between 1.8 and about 1 billion years ago. Maybe. Then, just to make their lives really complicated, our visitors discovered that there are still other approaches to this question. I told you it's an important question. So there are all kinds of methods being used to try and deal with it. For example, Earth as a planet has cooled over geological time as the production of heat by radioactive breakdown has decreased and heat has escaped into space. Therefore, one might expect that older rocks should record higher metamorphic temperatures than younger ones. But more importantly, cooler rocks are also denser than hotter rocks of the same composition. So they would tend to sink into the planetary mantle and thereby record higher pressures. And sinking crust is exactly what happens in subduction zones that are parts of modern plate tectonics. Now, while what I've just told you is a gross oversimplification on my part, this diagram here shows that Earth's crustal rocks do indeed seem to record higher pressures. In other words, a lower pressure, a temperature, a, a temperature to pressure ratio after about a billion years. There's four billion, there's one billion, the blue here is the is the 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 the, uh, the 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 low temperature to pressure ratio, which means pressures higher. So this is higher pressures and lower temperatures, and there they are down here on a continuous diagram. And according to the scientists that put this diagram together, they say that means that modern plate tectonics would have started relatively recently in the last one billion years ago, because these rocks weren't showing the right kind of density to get the high pressures that you actually need to prove that you had subduction. But of course, others disagree. So our intrepid extraterrestrial scientists have now run out of time learning about the Earth as a planet and they have to make a dash to get back on their galactic exploration schedule. Normally at this point in a presentation, I'd lay out my take home message, but tonight, Let's look at what our extraterrestrial visitors have learned about what we do and do not know about our home planet in 2020. Well, they left and went, uh, went about their business thoroughly confused. Why were they confused? Because just before they left, they learned that Earth-based planetary scientists are drawing upon their knowledge of the Earth as a planet to build hypotheses, interpretations, and models of other rocky planets in the solar system and are even projecting them onto planetary bodies that are indirectly detected around other stars. This really puzzled our visitors from afar. They asked, how can you make such projections about remote planets, even those in your own solar system, 
when you can't answer some of the most basic questions about the planet you know best. Last I heard from them, the extraterrestrials had decided to wait for a few more centuries before swinging by again to see how much progress we've made in understanding the Earth as a planet. It should make for an interesting visit. As always, thanks for listening, and please don't believe a word I've just said about extraterrestrials. Thank you, Simon. That's great. Are there any uh, questions for, for Simon? Okay, Chris, if you can share your deck again. There we go. Okay, we're going to have a uh, five minute break and we're going to go into the uh, M&M challenge. So Chris, if you can go to the next slide, uh, we'll have the answer after the uh, we'll have the answer after our five minute break. Okay, see you in five.
end up being quite close to the machine, don't I? Just looking at on there, mm -hmm. like the other guys are sitting quite a ways back from there. <clears throat> we can hear you, Brian. Your microphone's now on. Yeah, I just put it on. Sorry, yes. Yep. Dave, you might want to look at the answered Q and A's. There's a fun, fun one or two. There helps if I turn my microphone on. <laughs> Chris, if you can go to the next slide, please. So there's the answer to our, our challenge. Hopefully some of you were able to, uh, to guess what those images were. So we got M78 and Bolaleldus, I think is how you pronounce that. I, I may have totally uh, screwed that uh, pronunciation up, but we're not gonna worry about that. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Uh, Brian uh, McCullough, are you standing by? I'm here. Okay, I'm gonna highlight you. Uh, there we go. All right. <clears throat> we all set to go? Yeah, we're good to go. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, I've got a bit of a sad tale, a happy tale at the same time to share with you. Uh, as you can see, uh, actually, it's hiding at the bottom for me, but my uh, <clears throat> I'm de decommissioning my observatory. I've decommissioned it. So you can see I built it in 1994, and just over the Thanksgiving weekend, uh, we took it all down. But I just want to say that it, it's been 26 years uh, of uh, a lot of enjoyable uh, observations and um, in being able to share with people. If we go to the next slide, please, Chris. So I've enjoyed lots of evenings in the observatory. We're getting a view through the Telrad uh, right at what? Oh, I can't tell what that object is. Oh, I think it's the moon. There it is. And so I hooked up a video monitor one time just for fun. And I tried different things. And then, of course, a lot of people know that I uh, enjoyed making sketches. If we go to the next one, please. And uh, the way Simon, uh, when Simon does his explorations and he, he showed us one of his field, uh, field photographs, these are my field photographs. He presents in one way, I present in an entirely different way. Uh, when we get our, our, our people doing their observations later, everybody has their own style for sharing what they've learned and what they've, uh, what they've enjoyed through, uh, through, our, through our hobby. And I think this is what really makes it wonderful. Uh, if we go to the next one, please. So having an observatory has its benefits other than just looking at things. It makes a nice backdrop if you're uh, uh, taking photos of uh, comets. I think, uh, I think that's NeoWise, but uh, don't hold me to it. We'll go to the next one, please. So <clears throat> over the years, I've been doing, I've been, I've been teaching astronomy programs for 30 some odd years, doing public astronomy programs for the, uh, for the community centers. I was working at the Science and Tech Museum as one of the astronomy educators for 16 years before it, until it closed uh, for the renovations. But I, when I had my classes at the Mill of Kintail or in places in Canada or whatever, I'd have the classes come out to my observatory, to my backyard observatory. And uh, I'll mention that the guy in the red velour suit with his hand on his hip, uh, we'll see him again in just a moment. But uh, he's, a, he's a key figure in this obser observatory story. But I just want to pause just for one moment here. Uh, the telescope that the person's uh, bending down to look through, that's a 10-inch Dobsonian. Uh, uh, Glenn LeDrew put that together for me. So he, we, he got the sono tube and everything. And uh, that was the telescope that I used back in, I think it was 2001, to hunt down tiny little Pluto. And while it was still a planet, so uh, I've got that one on my on my list. But just a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, I had acquired another telescope from somebody. I'll, I'll explain why I'm, I'm why the observatory is coming down in just a moment. So a lot of change is happening, and um, <clears throat> so I uh, we're we're doing some tidy up. Uh, one of the things is uh, somebody asked me, one of my former students asked me, uh, Brian, they have a neighbor who's looking for a telescope. And so Bridget and I basically talked to this young fellow, young family, uh, very super keen. And uh, in the spirit that other people have donated equipment to me, uh, uh, we donated, uh, Bridget and I donated this 10 inch uh, Dobsonian to, that, to, the, uh, to the young family and I'm hoping they're gonna get some good use out of it. Okay, Chris, please, we'll go to the next one. <clears throat> All right, so here's what, here's what I've been working with for the past 26 years. I call it Bright Star Observatory because that's the name of the company that I formed uh, after um, I started a new phase of life as a, as a contractor, as an editorial and astronomy education contractor. 
So the you can see there, it's uh, basically an eight by eight square box with a little uh, hobbit entrance there. You got to watch, uh, you don't crack your head going in and out of there. Um, but you see the way it works is uh, there's a rot rotating dome. So the, 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 the box is, is eight, it's eight feet on the side, but it's only four feet high. So we've got the rotating uh, cylinder up top. And the, the hatch comes down, the root cellar doors open up. And uh, so you can steer the thing all the way around. So it's been very, very, uh, uh, very good that way. Uh, so basically my, my happy little playhouse. So we'll go to the next one, please. <clears throat> so before I had all of this, I had my next door neighbor, Norm. So same guy, same suit. Um, now just on the other side of his house, he's next door to me, uh, there's a circle and there was a street light that was shining down into my backyard. So when I was using my small telescope, in my backyard, pre-observatory, uh, things weren't too bad because Norm, Norman Davis, had a cherry tree that was blocking a lot of the light spillage into my backyard. So one day I went out to observe and oh my goodness, there's a whole ton of light plowing through here. What's happened? Good old Norm has chopped down his cherry tree. So I did the neighborly thing and I confronted him. I said, so what are you gonna do about that? And he had just retired from Bell Telephone and he goes, hmm, hmm. Well, you know what? We'll just have to start building your observatory. Wow. <laughs> you know, this is sort of beyond my capability just to build an observatory myself, but he's very good with his hands and constructing things. Uh, thing was, this is in the fall of 1994. He's one month away from snowbirding down to Florida. So anyway, there we are. I'd be going to work. I was working during the day. I'd get home in the evening. And this is what we do. And this is, I had to visualize it. I had to see, well, how big is... Uh, 11 feet. How big is eight feet? Uh, so we put all these sticks together. I brought my camera, my telescope tripod that I was working with, the small Schmidt Newtonian at the time, and we took all the measurements. And uh, we'll go to the next one, please. Uh, right. And then we got rolling, and it became a, a, a neighborhood family affair. So that's uh, that's Norm's son-in-law on the ground preparing the site, and you can see how we built the the framework for it for the observatory to go on. Uh, the little shrub right behind the guy kneeling, that's Gary kneeling there, that kind of sh little shrubby tree behind him, we ended up digging that thing out. So it has a box around it. Uh, we couldn't get the root ball through the box. So we just cut around, dragged the root ball with the box and stuck and planted it in our front yard. So now in our front yard, we got this uh, 55, 60 foot uh, horse chestnut tree growing there. So if you go to the next one, please. So Norm said, we'll get the platform built. We can use it as a work table. And uh, this was brilliant. And he had all these ideas for how we were going to construct things and how to make a large compass so we could draw the arcs for the uh, uh, for the semicircular areas that we're going to be uh, constructing. And if we go to the next one, please. <clears throat> so as you can see there, uh, we've got all these arced segments that went together to make a top ring, a bottom ring, and then it was paneled around. Now, to do the arcs, that took a huge amount of work. And what we had were boards, uh, rectangular boards uh, screwed together. And then uh, my wife, Bridget, and Norm's wife, Audrey, spent hours and hours with these uh, electric jigsaws, scroll saws, cutting these things out. And I'll just, this is what I've saved from my observatory. So here's a chunk of the arc. Well, not that kind of arc, but it's this arc, okay? So here's a segment that goes to here, another segment here. So they had to cut the inside ring, they had to cut the outside ring. Their hands were dead by the end of it, but it was a huge amount of work. We'll go to the next one, please. So there they are there. So that's Bridget on, that you see on the left, uh, using scissors there to uh, just get some uh, foam uh, filler. And uh, that's Audrey and, uh, and Bridget over on the right. So they, they did hours of work on that. We'll go to the next one, please. <clears throat> So it was a family affair, like I mentioned. So uh, in the background, you see Bridget uh, bending down, we're painting uh, some of the top part that was gonna go on top of the box before we put the dome ring on. So the boy standing in the background here, that's our son, Ben. Uh, he works as a production manager for a tractor, uh, for a tractor company. Uh, in the foreground, we have Emily who lives in Newfoundland. I think a lot of people know she, she's an astronomer. And the little guy with the red paints, uh, down, paint tray down there, that's Nathan. And uh, Nathan is a, uh, is a geologist. If we go to the next one, please. And there's Nathan again, working with Uncle Norm. And Nathan just loved having a hammer in his hands. We'll go to the next one, please. Just loved it. So he was a very, very good helper, except it was a little bit trouble. If we go to the next one, we had trouble kind of getting him to dial it back. 
And I think if, if, a, if a picture tells a thousand words, that's got to be the one. He didn't want to put that hammer down. So we'll go to the next one, please. <clears throat> so there's some tricky bits to constructing the observatory. And the thing is, uh, there are all kinds of options for how to build an observatory. And I have to tell you, this was one of my dreams for a long, long time. I mean, uh, we put up winter, uh, we built up snow in the winter time and put tarps and we did all kinds of things that we saw people had done through astronomy magazine or sky and telescope magazine. But when Norm said, we're gonna get start building your observatory, I was so excited. It was just brilliant. But we're doing things basically like aircraft construction to make these domes. So the dome caps uh, are curving, they're, they're curving in two different ways. They're curving along and are curving down to the sides. So there was a lot of uh, tricky work uh, that went into it. But uh, Norm had a pretty good handle on what we're doing. Originally, his plan was, he said, well, what we'll do is we'll build uh, basically a cylinder. The, there won't be any box. We'll build the, the square base and put a tall cylinder that whole, the whole thing rotates. And to be able to put plants on the outside corners of the, of the platform. And then I thought, well, no, no, I, I can't stand losing all that space. So that's why we built the box around. So where Norm had the construction know-how, I knew what I wanted in an observatory to make things workable for myself. So let's go to the next one, please. <clears throat> so there's Norm working on some of the side panels now, and then we're, uh, we're putting the, uh, the walls up. You can see it's a bit of a neighbor uh, neighborhood barn raising that goes on there. We had a, we probably had about 15 people from a, from around the neighborhood and family working on that. We'll go to the next one, please, uh, Chris. Thank you. So here's the next stage uh, where now we've got the box built and the dome set or the yeah the dome sections for the rotating ring, and we did them in three pieces. And the whole idea was that Norm said from the outset. We'll build it so that if you decide that you move, you're going to move in a few years or something, you'll be able to unbolt everything and everything will knock down. It'll be and it'll be a prefab and you can move it with you. So it was a and it actually helped for a bit of the work when we were when we were eventually uh, taking it down. We'll go to the next one, please. <clears throat> All right. So that's fitting the dome caps up on top. And go again, please. And that's about as far as we got before Norm had to uh, take off to, uh, to Florida. So we toasted that. And then after that, uh, there was a guy named Bernie a couple of doors down uh, who knew his way around one end of a saw from another. And he came and he helped fit the, the final shutters, the root cellar doors and that to, to make the shutters. And we'll go to the next one, please. So <laughs> here's Nathan again. All right, so he's a little bit older now, and this is a few years on. So what I'd wanted to do was get off the tripod, the field tripod that I had there, and install a pier. All right, so is it any surprise that, Nelson, uh, that Nathan became a geologist coming up from underground with a shovel on his hands? So we go to the next slide, please. All right, even more neighbors. There's Wayne on the right there. Uh, he was helping uh, with, a, he helped me with a, a lot of maintenance and over the years on the observatory, but Don, uh, who's our heavy metal guy there working away there. He worked, he, he worked for E.B. Eddy in the metal shop. And when I needed to get some adjustments made on this beautiful square tube that I bought from my pier and for the plates to, so I could have an adjustable, uh, uh, fully adjustable pier head to put the wedge on, uh, he, was, he was just great. People just, they loved the project. So now we'll get starting to install the pier. We'll go to the next one. Uh, oops. Uh, I guess I was trying to pull her a line too soon there. I'll go to the next one. So underneath the floor of the observatory, down on it, we had poured a concrete pad. And this is how we attached the pier to the to the pad. And you can see that the way the bolts are done there, everything's adjustable. So if, uh, if things shifted, if the ground shifted over the years, I could always go down and make adjustments to bring everything back up into true. And we threw some uh, bags of sand on top of the uh, feet there just to deaden any vibrations. We'll go to the next one, please. <clears throat> and there she be. So there's my, I think that, I think that telescope was 20 some odd years old when I, when I bought it at the time. And uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's a great scope. It's a uh, for sale, by the way, the scope and pier are still for sale. Uh, contact me if you're, if you're interested. I, it, it just has a clock drive. I didn't want computers in it. Um, like I used to tell people, I get enough annoyance with computers uh, every day. I didn't need that in uh, with this. So it, uh, I spent many enjoyable uh, nights working with that uh, with that telescope. We'll go to the next one, please. So, and that's what it was. That was my little summer playhouse. 
Um, but it, it started to get a little bit uh, difficult for me to take care of the, uh, of the upkeep on it. I was uh, busy with work and there were other things going on and it was just getting a bit much for me to, to manage. If we go to the next one, please, Chris. In the winter time, of course, and having to clear the snow and the ice off. And one year I had that, that step ladder, the patio was actually clear, but there was still ice and stuff up. And I had it up against the, the side of the observatory and was clearing some snow and the ladder, the bottom of the ladder shifted out about a, a foot. So you can imagine how the top of it dropped down where I was standing on it. And I just dropped that, that foot or two and, but it was such a jarring uh, blow on my neck, which had already been injured from a car accident some years before. And I hit my shoulder on that little doorway going to the observatory. I was months getting over that, uh, coming back from that. So there were decisions to be made. I, I couldn't clear the ice and snow off it anymore. And this is what I was thinking that, you know what, I think it's, um, I think it's time. Uh, Bridget and I had been talking with that for a while time to change the way I'm enjoying my, my, my astronomy. And this is one thing I'd always talk to people about uh, when they're buying a telescope or, or whatever it is that they're doing, uh, do it so that it's enjoyable. If you buy a telescope, you don't have to have it out every clear night, go and enjoy it when you want. So now uh, I, I got to the point where I realized, yes, absolutely, I'm 100% sure this is the right thing to be doing. So we'll go to the next one, please. This was another. This was another reason. <laughs> so Chris Terran's son-in-law did a little cartoon because what happened one night was I was uh, I'd had this observatory for twenty some odd years, never once bumped my head, never once, until I was carrying something out of the observatory and I guess I I stood up too quickly, whatever it was, and I clunked my head. I clunked my head on that uh, on that four by four, the whatever it was, the two by four beams there, and fell to the floor. And uh, so I, I ended up with a concussion. I ha I had a headache for four months from that. So uh, Chris, just to let you know that I appreciated the the humor when he gave it to me, but I couldn't really appreciate the humor of it for uh, for a few months. It still my head hurt so much. Let's go to the next one, please, with some dark music. I say the dark deed begins, but actually it's the darkness goes into the light. Let's go to the next one, please. <clears throat> so here we go. So uh, Nathan was home from Sudbury uh, over the Thanksgiving weekend. And uh, you can see the, see the dome cap there, like the open shutters. And just below you see that curved dome cap. It, it, there's almost not, it's just about uh, fiberglass. That's all that's left is none of the, the wood is all rotted away from inside there. A lot of the main structure was actually quite solid. So it was still pretty good that way. But anyway, he's already taken the doorway off. We'll go to the next one, please. Um, so here we are, Thanksgiving weekend. There's Nathan getting ready to go. And I should mention that, uh, well, two things. For one thing, he doesn't fit through that hole for the pier anymore. <laughs> uh, the other thing was I wanted to be sure to do this when the best object to observe was in the sky. And there was a, a waning crescent moon. We don't see it in any of the photos, but there's a waning crescent moon watching down over us as we do the work. Let's go to the next one, please. So uh, so my other son, Ben, who's on the ladder, uh, came over with his friend, Jarrett. Uh, they, they're, they, uh, <clears throat> they're quite, their families are quite close. And so Nathan, Jarrett and Ben were gonna be the construction crew. So I, I mostly stayed out of the way, picking up screws, putting them into the bucket, that type of thing to keep a safe uh, work environment. We'll go to the next one, please. And, <laughs> Man, oh man, I got to tell you, when, you, when you've built something and now you're getting ready, you're tossing the screen off and here, the, the dome off and here it goes. When they tossed it off, of course, it rolled like a wheel. And where did it roll, Chris? We'll go to the next one, please. It rolled right across the lawn, rolled and didn't bump into the tables there and flopped right there. You see Norm sitting by the fence with his camera? He never once looked up from the camera. He, I don't even think he even noticed that thing falling. Let's go to the next one, please. So it just, you know, it took about a month or so to build the observatory and it took him about two and a half hours. We can go to the next one as well. It took about two and a half hours to tear the thing down. It was uh, quite, an, uh, quite an amazing uh, uh, evolution. We'll go to the next one, please. There's our, the A team. And again, please, Chris. And again. Hey, where's my observatory? And again. So when I was in the Navy, I saw lots of lonely peers, <laughs> but none as lonely as this guy standing up here. That was 
that was depressing looking at that, but I knew it was the right thing to do. We'll go to the next one, please, Chris. And the, the, it's going to take the, the two or three of them to haul that sucker out of there. It's quite, quite heavy. And um, uh, go to the next one, please. Oh, is that a, oh, there's the moon landed on there. And just a couple more to go. So we'll go to the next one, please, Chris. So years ago, I remember helping Art Fraser tear down his observatory, load it up on, on a flatbed, and we took it up to uh, Fred Lossing Observatory, Indian River Observatory, and uh, we we're going to set it up there. And now, and, and that was from Vernon, Ontario, to Flo. Ben lives in Vernon. So here's my observatory down on a flatbed going to Vernon. We'll go to the next one. This is what I'm excited about. Now, this particular scope is one that actually I donated in 2016 to a London Centre member who was doing, doing public outreach but didn't have a suitable scope. So I gave him my old teaching kit of a 70 millimeter. So I have a very similar 80 millimeter refractor kit that I'm using. And I'm really excited, really, really excited about getting back to small telescope observing uh, because what I'm doing now, I, I'm going to enjoy my astronomy in a slightly different way through uh, some more writing, all right? So writing some fiction. So we'll go to the next one, please. And uh, Mick, <laughs> if you're watching, this one's for you, mate. And we'll go to the next one, please. So there it is, the end of an era. And, uh, and as I say, it's a happy start to the next phase of enjoying my, uh, my astronomy hobby. So uh, Dave and Chris, thank you very much for helping me get this presentation set up. And uh, have a good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Brian. We're going to move into our observation reports. Just give me a second here. I've just got to find everybody. And uh, I believe, uh, Jim, you have been, no, I haven't done that yet. Just a second. Uh, where are you here? Okay, I've spotlighted Jim. And You'd have to uh, remove spotlight from Brian. There we go. Okay, Jim. Okay, you can hear me. Okay. Yep. No problems. Okay. Great. Uh, so I have a quite a few images here tonight. Um, I had a busy fall, lots of observing opportunities, uh, but I, I wasn't able to attend the November meeting. So I'm playing a little bit of catch up tonight with my observing reports. Uh, this first image is of the Moon-Mars conjunction that happened on October 3rd, which just happened to be the night of our uh, October RAST meeting. I didn't really know that there was a conjunction going on until I happened to poke my head outside around uh, midnight and I noticed this uh, scene high in the sky. So I quickly set up my, uh, my four inch refractor with uh, AS, ASI 294 color camera to capture this image it was from around 12.30 um, uh, that early morning, and it was a stack actually of 10% of about 1,000 frames. I stacked it in AutoStacker 3 and sharpened it using uh, Registack 6. Now, one aspect of this image that uh, surprised me, or at least the capturing of it that surprised me, was how much the moon actually moves relative to the rest of the night sky when we're observing it. So if we could go to the next slide, please, Chris. So this image shows how much the moon moved over the course of the six minutes that I captured image data. So <laughs> it's quite a bit, as you can see. And so I had to do a little bit of trickery to get that image that you saw initially. Uh, I stacked the image data twice, once centered on Mars, and once with uh, the moon as the alignment target. And then in Photoshop, I had to combine the two aligned elements to get that final image. Anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting that over the course of such a short period of time, you can actually observe the moon moving about the earth in its orbit. So that's kind of neat. Uh, next image, please. So like many other RASC members, I've made a number of attempts to image Mars during the last couple of months. Uh, this image summarizes mon uh, some of my more recent attempts. Also shown is probably the best recent image of Mars captured using an Earth-based telescope. It was captured on the 30th of October by well-known planetary imager Damien Peach. I'm sure a number of you have heard of him. And he was using a one meter aperture scope located in the Chilean Andes. 
a little bit better conditions than uh, where I shot from in my backyard in Ottawa with a, uh, a 0.25 meter scope. But nonetheless, I think I did pretty well with my Mars capture from the same date in comparison to, to Damien's. Uh, you can see the south polar cap pretty clearly in my image. You can see the clouds that were in the north and the, on the west side. And you can see a lot of the main surface features that uh, Damien has in his image just uh, rotated uh, with the Mars has rotated through a, a number of degrees um, between the times that we took our images. So I was pretty happy with what I was able to get from my location. A few other things to point out. Um, the first image there on the top from the 24th was uh, my attempt at the observing challenge from October, which was to capture uh, Solus Lacus, the uh, eye of Mars. Actually, it didn't come out too, too, too bad. Uh, another thing to note is uh, if you compare the three images from the three different dates, you'll see that they actually differ quite a bit in size. They were all taken with the same scope and the same camera. So this diff the size difference is only due to the fact that Mars is moving further away from us. These were all taken after the uh, opposition date, which was earlier in October. So the whole time that I was taking these images, it was moving further and further away. And the difference in size is quite noticeable. The, uh, the final thing I wanted to note from these Mars shots was uh, on the images from the 9th of November. They're each about 20 minutes apart. Um, and if you look carefully, you can see that the surface features are shifted relative to each other. And, and so it, that's showing that even in that short of a period of time, you can see the rotation of Mars, which I thought was, was pretty cool. Uh, by the way, all of these are uh, stacks of the best 300 frames out of 5,000, uh, stacked in auto stacker and sharped in Registax. Uh, next image, please, Chris. So uh, this image is the uh, Lunar Observing Challenge for November. Um, Tycho Crater, which is uh, just a little bit below center. It's the, uh, the large, fresher looking crater. I captured it with my 10 inch Richie Kretchen at its native uh, focal ratio of F8. I used a ASI 183 monochrome camera and a new filter that I just got uh, this month, an astronomic Pro Planet 642 IR pass filter. And uh, so far I'm quite happy with that filter. So this is a stack of the best 200 frames out of 3000, stacked in auto stacker and sharpened in Registax. The image was captured pretty late in the evening in order to get the last quarter phase high in the sky. I rotated the view here to show more of the features along the Terminator, including one of my favorite craters, Clavius, which is on the right. I'm pretty happy with the detail I captured in this image, including the many terraces around the rim of Tycho Crater, the complex multiple central peaks, and the secondary impacts that surround the crater to the northeast, which is up and left uh, in this image. I hadn't noticed before now, but the fact that the secondary impacts, so that's all the kind of squiggly looking craters uh, in the area, uh, like I said, in the, uh, to the up and left from the crater, uh, that's from debris cast out of the uh, crater during the impact. And it's interesting to note that it's, it's only in that one sector, the upper left. It's not all the way around the uh, perimeter of the crater, which uh, suggests that maybe this impactor hit the moon on, a, on an angle coming up from sort of the lower, the lower right when it hit. Uh, next image, please, Chris. So this is a composite I put together showing the, uh, the solar active region 2781 as it looked on the 8th of November. It was very exciting to finally see some sort of significant activity for a change. The sun has been really, really quiet for at least uh, a year, maybe, maybe two. 
Um, so it was great to see something uh, interesting to look at for a change. The seeing conditions weren't very good um, with the transition between hot and cold that we're getting now uh, day to night. Uh, there's uh, really unsteady air over the city, so uh, seeing was pretty bad. But uh, nonetheless, I was pretty happy with the detail I was able to capture. So these are all captured using my uh, 98 millimeter refractor with a 2.5 times Barlow and an ASI 290 monochrome camera. I added the color to the images after they were stacked and sharpened. Each uh, inset image was a stack of the best 200 frames from 5,000. I, I captured so many frames because of the poor seeing. All but the H alpha image, the middle lower image, uh, they were captured using a Bader brand Herschel solar wedge, plus the bandpass filter noted with each image. The H alpha image was captured using a solar scope brand 50 millimeter Adelon, which was uh, put on to the same refractor. So uh, hopefully we will see some more activity on the sun as we move forward into the new year. Uh, next image, please, Chris. So this is another lunar image, obviously. Uh, this one captured on November 10th. It was captured during the waning crescent phase. So I got up at 4.30 in the morning in order to get this high in the sky. And I'm quite pleased that I made the effort because the seeing conditions were excellent. This particular image is centered on Mare Humarum, Humorum, uh, an impact basin on the western limb of the moon. It's about 425 kilometers across. The most prominent feature is the complex 110 kilometer wide crater. Uh, try to pronounce this correctly, Gassendi. It's a French name, Gassendi. It is a heavily worn crater with multiple central peaks, partially flooded floor, and lots of intricate rifts crisscrossing the crater floor. It's quite a fascinating crater to study. Um, there are lots of other fascinating details in the area, uh, lots of other rifts, uh, lots of interesting craters, um, all of which were made quite striking, I found in this image because of the really shallow sun angle. This is for sure the best image I've ever captured of this region, so I'm quite happy with it. Uh, the image was captured uh, with a, my 10 inch Richie Kretchen and the uh, ASI 183 monochrome camera with that same uh, astronomic ProPlanet 642 filter. It's a stack of the best 300 images from a capture of 3000, stacked in auto stacker and sharpened in Registax. Uh, next image, please, Chris. So I also had uh, quite a few opportunities to do some deep sky observing this fall. This image here is of NGC 7000, the North American Nebula. And uh, I put this image in as a fond farewell to the summer constellations that are now making their way into the west out of our skies for another year. This nebula is just one of the 26 objects I captured that night during a fabulous observing session I had from my uh, central Ottawa backyard on the 14th of November. Uh, Simon was actually online uh, Zoom with me that night. It was a great night. It is a live stack of uh, 35 20 second frames captured using a Mellencam DS432 monochrome camera with an Optolong L-Extreme filter on a 66 millimeter refractor. Uh, next image, please. So this next image captured on the same night is of the area around one of the observing challenges for November, the open cluster M52, which is down in the lower left. Uh, this cluster sits in a very busy part of the Milky Way between the constellations Cepheus and Cassiopeia. Roughly in the center of the image, we have NGC 7635, the bubble nebula. Continuing up towards the top, there's NGC 7538, the Northern Lagoon Nebula. And then continuing up to the very top edge, there's a small cluster there called NGC 7510, the Dormouse Cluster. The large nebulosity 
on the left is Sharpless 2 161, and the one on the right is Sharpless 2 157, also known as the Lobster Claw Nebula. This image is a live stack of 46 20 second exposures using the same setup as uh, for the previous image. Uh, next image, please. So now we're moving into the winter sky. This is in the constellation Monoceros, just east of Orion. I think that's the title of a book, isn't it? East of Orion. This is an image of the Rosette Nebula. It's made up of a number of NGC um, designated objects, uh, 2237, 2238, 2239, and 2246 referred to the nebulosity itself. And then the open cluster in the middle is referred to as 2244. It's a lovely example of an active star forming region. The nebula is located about 5,200 light years away and is thought to be about 130 light years across. So it's quite, quite large. I find this image has a 3D feel to it, giving the impression we are looking through a keyhole into the interior of this stellar nursery. The image is a live stack of 45 20 second exposures captured on the, the same night, the 14th of November using my 98 millimeter refractor and an ASI 294 camera with a new filter from Astro Hutech called the NBX. I'm quite happy with that filter as well. Uh, final image, please, Chris. So this was taken at the end of my observing session on the 14th. It is of uh, a new comet in the skies called the C2020 M3 Atlas. Uh, it was passing by the bright star Bellatrix in the constellation Orion on this particular night. That's the bright star that you see in the lower right. The elongated core that you can see in this image illustrates how far the comet moved in the seven and a half minutes it took me to capture this image. The image is a live stack of 23 20 second frames using the same setup as from the previous image. This comet is presently in Taurus, but it's pretty faint. You will need a telescope to see it visually from the city. That's it, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, let, we're gonna move on to Andrea and welcome Andrea. This is her first presentation for us here. So just give me a second to set you up. There, I believe I have you spotlighted. Yes, there we go. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. And yes, this is my first time presenting my observations. What I have uh, presented on the screen now is the bubble nebula. This was my very first image that I took with a new hyperstar lens. Some of you obviously know that a hyperstar is a lens that you attach to the front of your Schmidt Cassegrain and you replace the secondary mirror and it makes your telescope very, very fast. Um, I have been doing astrophotography since about the summer, but I have been doing visual astronomy for much longer. I happen to have a Celestron C11, a Schmidt Cassegrain, and I had a pretty heavy duty mount with it, the CGEM. All summer, I did some initial astrophotography with a red cat refractor. So a very small 250 millimeter refractor. And I got sort of my feet wet into astrophotography. And then I decided to go and get the hyperstar. I knew this would be the very first target I wanted to take a picture of because I love the bubble nebula and I wanted to get deeper into the sky. And so with the hyperstar, I got to a focal length of about 540 millimeters. Could I have the next slide, please? The reason I have both of these images is that one of the things I did with the initial image is I was using Photoshop and this image that I have now of the bubble was my very first image that I tried to process using PixInsight, which is, a, I think, a lot more complicated software, but I really think it made some really big differences in my image. This image was shot, I think, the same night that um, the previous speaker was talking about, November 14th, 
overnight into the 15th. A beautiful clear night in Ottawa. I live in Carp, um, very so on the western edge of the city. This image was done with the Hyperstar. Um, I took three minute exposures and this was about 52 sub exposures, so about two and a half hours. The big thing that I noticed with the Celestron was that with my little red cat refractor, I didn't have to worry about the wind and I could do very long exposures. With the bigger telescope, I had a lot of problems with wind and I lost a lot of exposures and it was a lot harder to have good guiding. Um, and I think with the Hyperstar, I don't need to have such long exposures. Can we go to the next uh, slide? This was um, another uh, image that I shot a couple of nights later, also with the Hyperstar. I decided to try and go for a nebula that's considered to be rather dim. And this is the Cave Nebula, uh, Sharpless 2177. This nebula is in the same part of the sky as the Bubble Nebula near Cassiopeia Cepheus region. Again, in this image, I went to process it in Pix Insight, and I really, really loved uh, all the white, all the pink nebulosity that I saw in Pix Insight. And if you flip to the next image, this was the image that I did. Uh, I think I think this is the one that was more Photoshop. Um, so Photoshop, I had a lot more trouble getting the colors right, and I found that PixInsight was a lot better. I should add on the color front, all of these images were taken with an L Enhance uh, filter. So that has, um, it's a narrowband filter. I have learned some lessons from the Hyperstar, and if you go to the next image, this was one that I took a couple nights ago, and it's the Crescent Nebula, and it's heavily cropped. But one of the things that I decided to do was to top, stop taking such long exposures. I, this, this was a stack of only about 75 uh, 60 second exposures. So just over an hour, it eventually dipped behind my house. So I had to move on to another image. But I was quite pleased with the Hyperstar. It makes the optics very fast. And I think I have some little white wisp of oxygen in the image. And uh, again, this was taken with an L Enhance filter. And then my last image that I took that evening, if you flip over, was the wizard. The wizard is also in the same area as the bubble and the cave. It's over in, in, near Cassiopeia. Again, this was an image that when I first imaged it, the summer was tiny, tiny little smudge with the red cat refractor. And I was happy to have a much bigger and larger image this image was again with the L Enhance filter. It was 135 60 second exposures. I use a one shot color camera, the ASI 533. And that's about it. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. Amazing images. Uh, we thank really you. appreciate that. Okay, I'm going to, next person up is, is Gabriel Dorner. So I'm just going to uh, spotlight you. There you go. All right. So hi, everyone. This is my second time presenting. Um, everything that you'll see was done over the last couple of months with this exact telescope, which is uh, which is a four inch refractor. So what you see is the uh, is the <laughs> yeah, it's, it's also the Crescent Nebula. This was done back in um, I think this one was done in April, uh, just after I bought some uh, some equipment and I did a, like a two hour travel to get to a camping ground where the sky is a bit better. So we're going to go to the next slide, please. This is, yeah, also the Wizard Nebula. Um, this one was taken with, with SHO. Uh, it's, it's the SHO color palette. In terms of integration time, I have 100 times 5 minutes for H hydrogen alpha, 100 times 300 seconds for, for oxygen 3, and 100 times um, 300 seconds for sulfur two. So you can do the math. This project took about 10 to 12 nights to do. Uh, it's still not as crisp as I liked it to be, but I'm probably gonna be back on it probably next year. So we're gonna go to the next slide, please. This is the Elephant Trunk Nebula, uh, also with SHO color palette. Um, this one total was about, about 
two to three hours. So way shorter than the Wizard Nebula, but it's a much better target also. So it, it sometimes you, you can get away with less hours of uh, integration time. So we're going to go to the next slide, please. All right, so this is the Tulip Nebula. Um, this is about 10 hours of integration time. Uh, this was done in September. Uh, this took about, I'd say, probably four nights to do. Um, but the transparency wasn't quite good at these times. So it's, it's a bit blurrier than the other ones. So we're going to go to the next slide, please. I think this is probably my favorite of this year. Um, this is the, uh, the Witch Broom Nebula. Uh, this one was taking over, was, was took in August. Um, I, I, I was one week at a campground about three hours north of here. I stayed there for two weeks, but three nights of that stay, uh, I did the, the Witch Broom Nebula. Um, so it's about 10 hours of integration time with SHO. Um, that was put as luminance over the RGB data, which means all the red and the blue is a bit more uh, is a bit more detail. So I, yeah, I think these are all for now. Um, I'm probably going to to, to next next month. Uh, I have a couple more that aren't quite ready yet. They were all done with uh, with PixInsight also. Okay, thank you very much, Gabriel. Great images. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bob Olson. Yeah, how do you do? Uh, this is the Scorpion uh, M52, which is one of the uh, challenge objects. Uh, it's it's above Polaris right now, uh, between six and eight o'clock in the evening, and uh, it's near the west edge of uh, the W in Cassiopeia. Uh, I I do not see that it looks like a scorpion actually, uh, but once I had this uh, uh, open cluster, I sort of got carried away and took a couple more. So next slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, M38, the, the starfish cluster. And in this one here, I can actually see, sort of see a starfish in it. Uh, it's high in the east, which for me in my location is perfect. Um, now, Attila Danko one time described open clusters as boring open clusters. And you know, visually maybe they are, but when you start uh, looking at images of them, there's just so much variety and uh, brightness of the stars. They actually have a sort of a kind of a beauty of their own. Okay, next one. Uh, this is uh, M48, and it's actually a pretty loose open cluster. And uh, there's three groups in it, and they're all going in slightly different directions. And uh, they think that's probably because it got uh, uh, disturbed by the uh, galactic plane. Uh, it's low in the east right now, and uh, it's about 30 degrees uh, east of the moon. Uh, to the, I'm sorry, to the, uh, to the right of the moon. And so it's um, uh, not a great target for a couple of days. Okay, next one. Uh, this is M93, it's low in the east. It rises at uh, 10.30 this evening. Uh, it's called the butterfly cluster and I can actually see a butterfly pattern in that. Okay, next one, please. Uh, this is the double cluster. Um, it's uh, way too big for my scope. Uh, this is actually a mosaic of two images. Uh, there's about uh, two full moons across this image, uh, if you were looking for, to compare it to something else. Um, and it's just a fantastic view on a small scope or binoculars. Uh, really should really see it. At 10 p.m. tonight, uh, the thing will be almost straight up. Uh, it, uh, it's just a wonderful target to see. Looks like jewels. Okay, next object, please. Uh, this is one of the challenge objects. It's a very nice galaxy. Uh, it's uh, surrounded by a bunch of little fainter galaxies. Um, the big galaxy is about 40 million light years away, and the smaller galaxies are between three and 400 million light years away. Uh, quite a bit of detail shows up in it when you take an image of it. Uh, next one, please. Ah, this was the uh, break time challenge. Um, it's, uh, to me, it always looks kind of spooky. And uh, in this particular image, an awful lot of the sort of the fine texture of it showed up. Uh, M78, um, it's a reflection nebula. 
the, it's blue because it's made a, got a lot of dust in it and the dust uh, sort of uh, reflects blue light better than uh, other colors. And so the, there's more blue in it than anything else. Um, it's above and to the left of Orion's three belt stars. So you could uh, uh, easily find it now. Okay, next one. And uh, this is the Orion Nebula. Uh, every single person who's ever looked through a telescope in the winter has seen this. It's about uh, 1,300 light years away. Uh, it's the closest region to us where there's massive star formation. Um, its mass is about uh, 2,000 suns. It's a, so it's a, got a lot of stuff in it that's going to likely form stars. Uh, the bright area in the very, very middle um, is uh, what we look at in the telescope. And so the, I concentrated in this image on um, the faint nebulosity around the bright area. Uh, and I saw a question, by the way, about the spikes on my stars. I have a, I have a Newtonian telescope that I'm imaging with, and it's got uh, uh, holders that hold the secondary mirror, and they uh, form uh, diffraction spikes on my telescope if I look at any bright star at all. I really like them. A lot of astronomers hate them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Gordon Webster. Just give me a second here. Okay, you're on. Okay, so as Bob mentioned, when you take an image of NGC 7331, you get lots of detail. When you're just doing it visually and sketching it, eh, not quite so much. Next one, please. This is an old favorite. It's uh, M57, Ring Nebula. It's magnitude uh, 9.4, uh, 2,600 light years away. And the central star is magnitude 15.3. And the nebula actually now is larger than it was then. It's expanding at 30 kilometers a second. These images uh, were all, or sketches were all done uh, November 14th at the FLO star party using my 12 inch daub. Uh, next one, please. Okay, um, this is a group of galaxies in Pegasus, NGC uh, 761976. Sorry, you can't see me pointing at my screen. Uh, the one on the left is uh, 7619. The one on the right, I believe, at the top is uh, 7623, and the one at the bottom, no, other way around, 7626. The one at the bottom is seven. 7623. Um, 7619 and 70 is magnitude 12.1 elliptical. Uh, 7626 is 12.2 and it's an elliptical. And the last one, 7623, is 13.9 lenticular. And it was tough to catch. Next one, please. This one was a bit of a puzzle. Uh, several years ago, there was an article in Sky and Telescope uh, column, uh, Going Deep, that focused on uh, galaxy groups in Pegasus. And the column is aimed at larger scopes than, uh, than my 12-inch. Uh, but um, I like to push it if I can. And so I made up a bunch of post-it notes about where these galaxies were located and uh, stuck them on my charts. And yes, I still use paper charts. So at the FLO star party, I spotted this post-it note and realized that I still hadn't observed this group yet. And it's located near uh, Markab, uh, which is the alpha star in Pegasus. And uh, it's also located near the NGC 7448, which is another spiral galaxy. So I entered NGC 7464 into the GO2 on the scope. And when I looked in the eyepiece, there was a faint fuzzy in the near the upper edge of the field of view. I centered it and studied for a bit. Notice my camera's off, see if I can get it going. No, it won't come back. 
Um, so I centered it, studied it, and I found the second galaxy and decided to do the sketch. On Sunday, I was checking my sketches against the uh, eyepiece view in Sky Tools, just to confirm what I had seen, since I only found two of the three galaxies that were supposed to be there. Uh, the eyepiece I was using was an eight millimeter, which yields 188 times magnification. In a 13 mil eyepiece at 115, NGC 7448 and NGC 74. 464 are in the same field of view. To make things worse, the star pattern on one side of the sketch better matched up with those near 7448 than it did with 7464, and it wasn't on the proper side. But there was only one galaxy anywhere near. I, I mean, 7448 is a galaxy all by itself. And I had definitely seen two galaxies. So the long and the short of it is, is after a lot of comparison and Google searches for images and sketches of both 7448 and 7464 group, I decided that this is indeed a sketch of NGC 7463 and NGC 7465. The target galaxy NGC 7464 wasn't quite visible that night. And not surprising because it's a 14.4 galaxy. So it means this galaxy group's gonna remain on my list until the next time I'm out at the FLO or a darker site. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Paul Cloninger. Just give me a second here while I replace the spotlight. There's a static image of Paul here. Hi there, Dave, can you hear me? <clears throat> yep, absolutely. Super. Okay there, uh, hi everybody. I, I hope you're all doing well out there. I only have uh, one observation to share with you tonight, but it's a bit of a funky one. So at last April's meeting, I mentioned an interesting observing challenge uh, centered on the star Wolf 359. On April 23rd, the New Horizons spacecraft was commanded to take an image of that star. The spacecraft at that time was 47 astronomical units away from the Earth. Such an image presented uh, us earthbound observers with a unique opportunity, but, but first a little background on the star itself. Next slide, Chris. Here we go. Uh, Wolf 359 is the eighth closest star to us here on earth after our sun at a distance of uh, just under eight light years. It's a small red dwarf with less than a 10th of the sun's mass and not much larger in diameter than the planet Jupiter. It's in the constellation uh, Leo, and it's, it's pretty dim, glowing at a magnitude of about plus 13.5. Uh, that alone makes it makes visual observing uh, of it a bit of a challenge. Under a dark, moonless sky, you might be able to see it with a good six-inch scope, but an eight-inch or larger would be better. If you're imaging it, it's an easy target with a six-inch or even a four-inch, provided you know exactly where to point it. So the unique part of this challenge for me was to image the star at the same time that New Horizons did, and then to compare the two images. Next one, please. So this is my image of uh, Wolf 359. Uh, I took this with my 11 inch Edge HD and a QHY9M uh, CCD imager. Well, since Wolf 359 is very close to us as stars go, an image taken from 47 astronomical units away compared to one taken from Earth at the same time will reveal something cool. From the spacecraft's perspective, Wolf 359 will appear in a noticeably different position with respect to the more distant background stars in the image field. This is a result of parallax and astronomers use this technique routinely to measure the distance to relatively nearby stars. They take a picture of the target star they're investigating at one point in time and then six months later, they take another picture of it. In those intervening six months, the Earth has moved halfway around its orbit uh, and effectively shifted its relative position in space by two astronomical units. The unique thing about this opportunity is that with New Horizons, we can have two simultaneous images from two different vantage points, 47 astronomical units apart. This yields a much larger parallax effect. And so I was pretty eager to see the uh, New Horizons image, especially since the spacecraft's imaging system has a field of view uh, comparable to my own setup. Next one, please. 
However, when the New Horizons images were released, I have to admit, I was a little disappointed. The spacecraft's camera had a sensor, has a sensor measuring uh, 1,024 by 1,024 pixels. But to take a, the images, the spacecraft operators set it to four by four binning, which increased the camera sensitivity and allowed for shorter exposures. It also reduced the size of the files to transmit back to Earth since the, sim the images were now only 256 by 256 pixels in size. Unfortunately, the trade-off in doing this was a loss of resolution and the, much, and the smaller image size made processing for image comparison a bit trickier, especially since my uh, image was much larger. However, you got to work with what you've got. Next slide, please. So the first step was to resample and or orient the uh, New Horizons image to match the scale of mine. You can see there's a lot of noise in the image and the stars are bloated from the resampling. Uh, since I was only interested in the stars in the New Horizons image, I decided to discard the noisy background completely and then do a uniform spherical reduction of the star sizes to match them to the same sizes uh, as those stars in my image. Next one, please. So that processing left me with an image containing only the New Horizons stars on a featureless background, but now at the exact scale and orientation as my earthbound image. Now I could combine the two. Next one, please. Uh, so then I, I subtracted the, uh, the, all the stars from my image and overlaid the stars from the New Horizons view. But since the New Horizons view image was purely monochrome, therefore colorless, uh, I did some artistic license here and uh, I let the New Horizons stars inherit the star colors from my original image. This is the resulting hybrid view as seen by New Horizons. Next one, please. So zooming in a bit, you can clearly see the shift in position of Wolf 359 with respect to the other more distant stars. The, this is the result of the parallax from the two images taken at the same time, but from two vantage points over 7 billion kilometers apart. Next, please. Uh, the schematic on the left illustrates this parallax effect. The two dotted lines originating near Earth show the annual parallax shift of a, a nearby star like Wolf 359 if you observe it six months apart from opposites, opposite sides of the Earth's orbit, a distance of two astronomical units. Because New Horizons distance from Earth was much larger than, uh, than that when it took its image, the observed parallax is accordingly much larger as well. To determine the amount of that parallax shift in this very zoomed in view to the right, I overlaid the New Horizons image on mine again, this time not colorized, uh, uh, but I didn't subtract my capture of Wolf 359. The other two stars you see here are much more distant and so we're in the same position for both New Horizons and myself. Since I know the image resolution of my equipment setup very precisely, I could then measure how far apart uh, the two positions of Wolf 359 were in this superimposed view, a separation of just under 16 arc seconds. So when I coupled my measured parallax angle with NASA information on the spacecraft's position and distance from Earth, I could then do the trigonometry and calculate the distance to the star. I was really pleasantly surprised to see how close this actually came to the currently accepted value of 7.86 light years. So this was certainly an interesting, albeit unusual observational opportunity to explore one of the closest stars to us. And I couldn't resist the further opportunity to generate one final view with this data. So here I got something a bit odd for you. Next slide, please, and my last one. Since Wolf 359 is so close to us compared to the other stars and objects in this field, by putting the New Horizons view and my view side by side, you can actually see Wolf 359 in 3D. This may be easier for some folks than others, but I've tried to size and place these two images to make it, to make it as easy as possible. So I'm gonna get you all to, to, <laughs> to, to do something odd here, but I want you to all kind of sit squarely in front of your monitor about a meter or so away from it. If you're looking at this from a smaller laptop display, 
a little closer may work better for you. Dimming the lights in your room may also help. Now, if you're in, in position, just cross your eyes slightly while staring at this and you'll see the central blue dividing line split into two. The view, between the, the, the view now between the two blue lines is the overlapping 3D view. Try to ignore the rest. Tilting your head a little bit to the left or right should also help you to align the stars. You'll know when you have it because Wolf 359 will appear to be floating in front of the distant background objects. I hope you can get that effect. It's, it's fairly easy to do, but if you haven't done it before, uh, it might take a little work. So perhaps we can give folks a moment or two to, to, to try to lock onto this, Chris, especially for those that have never tried this kind of stereo viewing. Uh, hopefully it does work for you. Perhaps I can get Gordon to include this view in the next edition of Astronauts, and you can try it uh, offline for yourself if you want to and play around with it a bit. So uh, 3D view, uh, we all get to observe Wolf 359 floating in space. Wishing you all a wonderful Christmas and a healthier and happier 2021. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you very much. Just a second here. There we go. Okay, so thank you very much. That that was a, that was a, a a lot of math. My my head hurts when I think about all the <laughs> calculations you had to do there. <laughs> and, it was fun. Uh, <laughs> yes. So uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, spending a little more time staring at it in astronauts. So uh, that would be great. Okay, so let's take a look at our observing challenges. Last month we had the beginner challenge of M fifty two, intermediate challenge of NGC seventy three thirty one. Advanced challenge was the uh, GCs of Fornax, the Dwarf Galaxy, and trade, uh, Crater Tycho was the lunar challenge. And next slide, thank you. So uh, our beginner challenge for this month is uh, Messe 77. It's a barred spiral galaxy in Cetus. Our intermediate challenge is NGC 660, polar ring galaxy in Pisces. And our next challenge, advanced challenge is NGC 2363 and 2366, irregular galaxies. And um, these will all be published in, in Astronauts. So uh, that, that should be coming out shortly. And then we are lunar challenges crater Pitatatus and uh, it's on the southern edge of Bear Nubium. So there's a summary of what our challenges are for this month. So hopefully we get some observation images. And the 2021 RISC calendars have arrived. I believe there's only a few left, those who have pre-ordered them. Uh, they're going to be distributed this weekend to the folks closest to you that where you've uh, designated that on the form. And uh, they'll be contacting you to arrange pickup and payment uh, if payment is required. Okay. So the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club on Tuesday, December the 8th at 7.30, Howard Simcover is presenting a, a talk on celestial transients. Um, you need to write to uh, Jacob D. Mueller at outlook.com. The, the email's at the bottom of the screen there and uh, to register for this uh, Zoom session. The Fred Lawson Observatory is open for members. Uh, we need to respect social and physical distancing rules while we are out there. And uh, yeah, we invite you to come out there. And unfortunately, our library is locked up inside the Canadian Aviation Space Museum, and we won't be able to get to that until uh, we're back into that uh, space. So here are the folks that uh, keep our club running. And thank you to everybody coming out tonight. We had 90 people out at the at any one time. Thank you to all the speakers and, and presenters. And thank you to the RESC National Office and uh, as they provide the uh, Zoom hosting for us. Any ideas, uh, feedback, please email me, meetingchair at ottawa.rasc.ca. My name is uh, Dave Chisholm. Be happy to get your feedback. And particularly, I'm looking for ideas for speakers into the new year. 
Membership of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, regular membership is $88 per year. Family membership is $82.50 plus $15 per adult, $8.10 per youth. And youth membership is $53 for those under 21 years old or under 25 if they are a student. So what do you get with that membership? Next screen, please. As a local member, you get access to the Ted Bean Loan Library. You have access to the uh, Flow Observatory site. And once the library reopens, you'll have access to our, our library as well. As well, uh, you're going to receive every two months Sky News, which is the National Astronomical Magazine uh, run uh, published by RESC. You're going to get the RESC Journal and the Observer's Handbook uh, you'll get uh, around this time uh, every year. Um, I received mine uh, just a few days ago, so hopefully all the other members have received there shortly. And of course, we've got our wonderful Astronauts written by Gordon Webster, uh, and uh, that comes out monthly. Our next meeting, because uh, New Year's Day is, uh, is on a Friday, we're moving our next meeting out to January the 8th, and it'll be another a Zoom webinar. At that meeting, we've got somebody who's going to be talking to us about uh, how they do astro imaging with their cell phone camera. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting talk. And we've got somebody talking about uh, meteor showers. So those are our two big topics for the upcoming meeting. I'll be sending out an invite uh, probably about a week and a half ahead for anybody who wishes to submit observation images. And is that it for the slides, Chris? That's everything. Okay, so thank you folks for coming out and uh, have a safe holiday season and we will see you in January. Just a Bye reminder, now. FLO Star Party next weekend to the 12th. The 12th, okay, thank you. But Gordon, it's your job to make clear skies. I'm working on it. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks folks, have a good evening. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.